Hello and welcome everybody to the latest edition of the Buy Round Interview Show. Now, I am joined by yet another legend of the game, uh, a Hall of Famer, and someone that is a bit of a pinch yourself moment for me, which I'm going to talk about in a little moment. Welcome, Wayne Pierce. James, great to be here, mate. I've heard all about the uh, this seat that I'm sitting in. You've had some pretty famous people in here sitting in their seats, so I'm very honoured. Yes, mate. Well, um, hopefully you you live up to the expectation that we've got for you. So, like I've said, this is a bit of a pinch yourself moment for me. So, when I have mentioned this to you before, but back in England, um, when we were playing representative games from about the ages of 10, uh, 11, those games would get videoed and you would each get sent a video of these games, like a bit of a, oh, you get to watch, you know, yourself playing at some, you know, at St. Helens, I think we played at um, a couple of other, you know, low-level stadiums, but they'd video the games and, you know, send them out to each, to each player. And now it was a company called Micron Video. And at the end of these videos, on would come a coaching lesson with Wayne Pierce. <laughs> It's a long time ago, well, about twenty-five <laughs> yeah, years ago, and I can remember watching these. And we, you know, you, you'd all, you'd watch yourself, but then you'd get super excited about the coaching lesson with Wayne Pierce. There was like three or four of them, I think, that you did about passing, tackling, and even listening to your voice. Now it's taking me back there, sitting there as a eleven-year-old, where I was just this sponge, just couldn't get enough <laughs> football. We didn't obviously in a day before. Um, the internet and, and YouTube and, and all that sort of stuff. We've got this Aussie legend teaching you about cast, pa catch, pass, all these different things. So it's um, a little bit surreal for me to be sat here opposite you. Well, it's, uh, well, it's great to, to hear that somebody at least watched those videos because <laughs> you, when you're recording, you think, oh, is anyone really interested in, in this? But um, yeah, no, it, it, they, thanks for that feedback. That's 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 I love that sort of feedback because when you know that you've um, helped someone in some small way, then it, it, it really does make a huge difference. So thank you. Yeah, it was, um, it, it, it's it's pretty surreal. That was you, back in the 90s, right? So yeah, it's a long yeah, while it ago. Have been, yeah, it would have been mid to late 90s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Can you remember recording Yeah, yeah, I can remember. I did, I did um, a, a few different types for different um, uses over, over the years. But um, yeah, I do remember those ones back in the, yeah. In the middle late nineties, well, yeah, well, they absolutely. Made, well, there was a, a heap of English kids that they got to watch them. It wasn't just uh, oh, thank just you. here in Australia. So um, yeah, yeah. It was. It, it's pretty cool to be to be sitting here next to you. But <clears throat> before we get into your career, I want to get to the making of you, the um, the footballer, endurance master, um, fitness revolutionist. What made you that way? Because we spoke to a, a number of your former teammates that. So you were a lot different. Um, we well, have a look at me. I'm I'm pretty uh, pretty small for football. So I'm I'm just average average height, um, pretty much probably average weight, and and but I love footy. And and the only way I, I was probably ahead of my my years uh, in, in terms of um, the way that I prepared, and the only way I felt I could get an advantage on on other players was to take a, a scientific and, and more clinical approach to, to pre preparing for games. Nowadays, everybody's into it because now they've exercise physiologists and psych sports psychologists and all that sort of stuff. But back then there wasn't. So when I left school, um, I went to university and I did a science degree and part of that science degree, I actually did um, uh, four years of psychology and um, that really gave me insights into the mind and the potential that exists in most people really – resonated with me so you know my, my, my career probably was built on marginal gains which was all the little things that people weren't doing that that collectively made a huge difference uh, to my performance and you know, it started off with a physical realm so when I was in my teens you know I, tr I made a decision to really train hard as I possibly could and then then when I started to explore for example, weight weight training. Back when I f was in my my late teens, there was a belief in in rugby league that if you did too heavy a weights, then you would slow you down. But I was looking at the sprinters around the world. The best sprinters around the world were doing these huge weights. They were mass had massive legs and and very powerful. And I thought that can't be right. 
So I started to really get into the heavyweights before a lot of other people started getting into heavyweights, rugby league players. And um, so that was, just, that was just a, an observation. That wasn't you didn't. Well, there was no there was no, there was no literature. There was no internet around. Yeah. Um, there wasn't in terms of books. There wasn't really much on the science of preparation for sport. There was some stuff on bodybuilding, which was not really what I wanted. It was more about power. So it was just trial and error and experimentation. And and um, I found it it helped me enormously. It helped me with with um, ex- explosiveness. It helped me with speed. It helped me in a number of ways. Uh, and it helped me um, with, with regards to to physically being able to to hit hard in tackles and and, um, and and make a difference. So that was that was where it sort of originated. The where I sort of got that edge um, and went from there. Really, yeah. Because the the slight edge can make all the difference. We've all got a um, genetic potential. Absolutely, but the power of the mind, getting the most out of your body. Yeah, we've all got that talent, and and it's not even just rugby league. I mean, we've all got natural talent in some way, some discipline of life. There's so many disciplines, but one of the challenges, one of the the issues I've I have with, for example, the education system is that it doesn't assist students to actually identify their talent and work towards that talent because that's where we're going to go, going to get the most um, bang for our buck. I would imagine. Um, and so for me, um, yeah, I was fortunate that I identified I had this um, th- th- this desire and that combined with a natural athleticism lent itself to me getting better and better but the more I, effort I put in as far as footy was concerned. But was there was this all internal or did you have any um, influences like anybody? In the early you? years, in the early years, no, in the early years, was was just a gut feel really because um really from like being I, a like a, what, what age are we talking here i'm talking about from the age of sort of 13 14 my dad died um suddenly and i had an amazing mentor come into my life then who gave me confidence and inspiration my mum w- was fantastic as well because she was a single mum there was three of us boys were living in a in a um in, in, in the inner city in Sydney in those days, which was just um, an area where um, you know, we, we just got we, you had enough to get by, and that was pretty much it. But um, but the Mr. Kokas, his name was, um, who came into my life, was was amazing in terms of giving me inspiration and and um, getting me to fulfil my potential. Um, but I'd started before that. I'd started. I went and saved up some money because uh, I was actually I, I was selling. Hot dogs at Leichhardt Oval. That was my. Um, that was as a as a kid. That was my. Um, my sort of got a bit of income there, and um, I was saving, and I just bought some weights, and I used to have a weights. My mum, God bless her, let me have weights in the lounge room. Yeah, and I had weights in the lounge room. I had a bench press, which I sort of hid out in the laundry, and um, I used to do the bench press and and um, and, and squats. Bought some squat racks after I had the bench press. I bought some squat racks and then started doing squats and. And this was like at 13, 14 years of age. And um, and anyhow, that's where it sort of started. And that, that's, that's amazing. That Like th- I'm just trying to think back like t- to my teenage years. And look, I, I loved rugby league and I was just a- along for the ride. Um, but there was plenty of distractions out there as well. Did you ever – because you're an absolute teetotaler as well. So there was, was there ever a distraction um, – with that side of things, well, the reason I, I I went down the teetotaler path was because my father was was an alcoholic, and it, they, I just didn't want that. Some of the experiences that I had, I won't go into that. I didn't really want that experience going forward from my perspective. So, um, yeah, so that I had a, a strong reason not to drink alcohol. So I never really got distracted around that. Um, so that was the, – the, that that party sort of scene wasn't really my sort of thing yeah. because a lot of the partying as for teenagers even then and probably now to revolve around alcohol. That's amazing that because – And i got nothing against against no, alcohol but, no. but it's just for me I made a decision yeah. that I didn't want to be tempted like that. It's amazing that because there's there's so many people that – go down that same road and it's it's they 
replicate the the behaviors that they they see they see at home yeah but i had a good good conversation with wayne bennett many years ago because he's the same as me yes he had a negative experience as a child and he went down the path that i don't want to be like that um but there's plenty of as you say there's plenty of people that well, have so that experience and go down that path so most people do I'm just um yeah just i don't know what it was it's but strong willpower as a as a teenager yeah, I mean, to, to have that to have that mindset as a as a teenager like i'm thinking now as an adult and some of the decisions that, that i make or i don't make and you know i have my weaknesses but as a teenager geez i was scatterbrained yeah. and just well, kind of difficult for me to comprehend being 13 and having that that's such a strong mindset yeah, well, it was just the experience that I'd, I'd had. I was probably old enough to sort of see the issues that the alcohol brought into the house. And um, whereas my, if I was a bit younger, maybe I wouldn't have seen that. So, and wouldn't have put two and two together. I think I was just at, at, the, at the right age to get the right messages. Mm. Yeah. So you're on the trajectory um, to becoming the athlete that you, uh, that you were. Coming through at the Tigers, you were you were hard nosed in your approach that that didn't change one iota. Yeah, as 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 I said, James, my my philosophy was my underlying belief was that I could the only way I could I could really compete was to actually try and address um, being at peak fitness, both both mentally and physically. So that was really where my focus was, and and. Um, and I was fortunate that, um, as I said, I had a mentor who was encouraging me. But but I had there was progress. I I, I was big on goal setting. I've always been big on goal setting. I, I I don't think a lot of people understand how important it is to actually set clear goals, but set challenging goals, and let the non conscious mind do its work around that, because it it will then look for opportunities and help you actually realize that goal i mean it's, it's, there's there's a science behind it and i was fortunate that i sort of tapped into that early so i've been big on always being on the goal setting piece can, can you talk us through some of those some of those goals yeah so so i mean for example that the the, the the non-conscious brain our non-conscious brains by pr, uh, control most of what we do day in day out and the, the science the neuroscience tells us that the non-conscious brain can process up to 20 million bits of information per second um, so that's a lot of information, uh, but coming in through on average is around about 11 million bits per second comes into the non-conscious brain, which is a lot of information coming in, but we can handle 20 million bits. So the brain's not going to overload, <coughs> excuse me. Um, but that what comes into the non-conscious brain has to be distilled down to only 50 bits per second, which is what the conscious brain becomes aware of. So, so there's, there's this 11 million bits per second come in to the non-conscious brain through all the sensory cells in the body and then only 50 bits per second um, reach the, the conscious awareness, which is what effectively we, we become aware of and, and can act on and so on and so forth. So how that happens is through a mechanism called the reticular activating system. So the reticular activating system is a, base, is a mechanism of dense neurons at the base of the brain that like a bouncer at a nightclub door. All these people want to get in the nightclub, they only let a handful of people in. So how does it work out what goes in? And that's, this is where goal setting is really powerful. Goal setting is one of the powerful tools that uh, if you internalise those and, and you know, mix that with, with, with visualisation, it makes a massive difference to what the non-conscious brain, which is operating 24-7, is scanning for. So once you clear on where you want to get to, the non-conscious brain will do its work. And it will actually see opportunities that you go, oh, that's a coincidence. No, it's not a coincidence. It's always there. But once you actually clarify what it is you want to get, get where you want, is you want to get to, it'll see these opportunities and that's where you get to. So for me, that's that mechanism has been has served me well over the years and all these coincidences happen because of that process that I've, I've been able to access or, or, or tap into, I should say. So I'm assuming you had some some goals about um, making it into the first team at the Balmain Tigers. 
Yeah, so so the goal originally was set by my my mentor, Mr. Kokas, yeah. So I remember he um he actually got me to sit down and, and, and close my eyes and just dream about what I wanted what, what I wanted to be. Yeah, okay. Uh, he'd give me a little task before that to work out what I what, what what's the biggest dream you, you would love to have that would make you the happiest you can possibly be. And so anyhow, and, and this was and it was playing for the Tigers. And this particular day, he got me to sit down and close my eyes and and um, just imagine that I was in this space. And he talked me through some scenarios as as, I, as if I was the star of this match in the future. And I was like 15 years of age. And um, and he sowed those seeds in into my non-conscious brain um, that in that really um, yeah, took root and and drove my, drove me sort of to be so dedicated, I think, around the, the preparation, which is what it was all about, to get to the end, end point. Yeah, the, the processes that, yeah. that are involved in that visualisation. I love it. Yeah. But a Tigers team, that time of year, the culture was very different. You were a trailblazer, an outlier. How did you fit into that culture? Was there much... Because I imagine there would have been... I know what football lads are like there's a lot of ridicule anybody that's different it's you've got to be yeah. you've got to be brave well to it's, be different it's a, it's a, it's a really good point james because um when i came into first grade um in the it was 1979 i played a couple of games off the bench um in the lower grades in the in reserve grade in the finals actually i played what happened was um I, I contracted. This is quite interesting. So at, at 18 years of age, uh, I played in a, in a New South Wales versus Queensland game. Mel Meninga was playing his same age as me. He was playing for Queensland under 18s. I was playing for New South Wales under 18s. And in that particular match, I got a head cut early on, and massive big gash over my eye. And the and in those days before your time, they used to have the bucket and the sponge. So they brought the bucket on the magic bucket and sponge. Magic sponge. Yeah. Yeah. So they brought the bucket and sponge on. This is like just before half time. So prior to that, the, the buck and sponge had made a number of trips onto the field where oh. where players were sucking on the sponge because they didn't have drink, uh, the hygienic drink bottles or stuff in those days. So players would be sucking on the sponge and they'd be spitting the water out, put the sponge back in. and So anyhow, just before half time, the bucket and sponge has come on and they've sponged me, this open wound down with this sponge with, where all these players had been, been mm. sucking on it previously. It's like a cesspit of... Oh, yeah. So anyhow, like, so what happened was... Um, I, I, I when I was strapped, uh, got my ha head strapped at half time came and played the rest of the game no problems about probably was about four weeks later three or four weeks later I couldn't get out of bed this day had no energy and um, anyhow I had to go to the, went to the doctor and the doctor sort of um, sent me for, got a blood test and I contracted what was called hepatitis B it was called serum serum hepatitis back then but it's hepatitis B which is um, um, it's it's nowadays you get a vaccine for it, so it's not a problem now. But it actually affects the liver massively, and um, and so I had no energy. My eyeballs were were yellow, skin was yellow, all the bile that got floods through your system. You got no energy. You've got no energy as either. So I, and I lost a massive amount of weight. Uh, this went on for like the process of recovering from that took about six months. Um, some people have permanent damage to their liver as a consequence. I didn't, fortunately. And um, anyhow, the back end of that season, uh, sorry, and, and, so, and it was they traced the, the source of the issue back to the bucket and sponge, and I'm the reason the bucket and sponge got banned because there was a recommendation from the the club doctor at the time, the, the or the sorry the um the club doctor, the doctor I went to contacted the sports medicine and anyhow they society and a federation I should say, and then they um anyhow the bucket and sponge got banned within a couple of years, but that was this catalyst for it. And anyhow, so that put me out to the, and I, that was under 18s going into the next year. So I was 19. And then the back end of that year, I, I came into, into, cause I got back on the field, put the weight back on and um, played, played a couple of games in off the bench in the reserve grade, um, grand final, semi final, grand final. And then in that off season, the first grade lock got, uh, massively, sorry, a guy called Neil Pringle had a some sort of um, virus that, that basically put him out of action. And so they put me up into the first grade, never played a full lower grade game in the first grade training squad. And because I was pretty fit, I was leading all the runs and stuff, I think they impressed the coach. 
and they put me in the first grade to start the season. And um, and I and uh, pretty much six weeks, eight weeks later, whatever, I was playing city seconds. So it was a pretty meteoric rise. But but the um, the reality was it was it was it was the the, the seeds that were sown by my mentor that gave me the 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 inspiration to actually get to where I got to and um, and overcome the the obstacles that were were in my way as well. But, but what about being around that dress, dressing room and you've got, you know, people finish training, go for a beer. You know, it was, oh, it, was, yeah, it, was so, it was commonplace. And but so the, I was yeah. wondering if you ever, if you ever questioned what you were doing because the amount of ridicule that you must have faced. Yeah, no, nah, it's a good, it's a good it, point. It would have, it, it would have been full on to the point of like, uh, you know, I'm just going to shut these guys up. And yeah, I'll, nah. just, I'll just be like one of the crew. No, no. But, but what what I remember what, what happened was um, we on the Tuesday night after training, quite often, almost every week, we go to a pub called the Three Weeds Hotel at Roselle, yeah? and that particular pub was was the local haunt where they go and have a have a have a me- have a bit of a feed and then have a meal. Uh, sorry, uh, have a um, have a have some drinks and a schooners. Yeah, so they'd. That, so they'd be on the drink and I'd go along and be wanting to fit in because I'm 19 years of age and I've just come up into the first grade and squad and and it was um, it was pretty tough because I, they were pressuring me to... to, to, to oh, um, the peer pressure would have been huge. Yeah, it was. And, and this is one of those moments, I think you call it sliding doors or whatever, but where I said no, I said no, and then this next week I go and, I, and I'm thinking I've got to have a drink to keep them happy. But then what happened was a couple of the guys said, Piercy, you're not drink, you're not drinking, hey, can you drive me home tonight? Two of the guys. And um, and then oh this this was before the designated driver concept was around, yeah? Um, so I actually gave these couple of guys a lift home. And then the next week, a couple of other guys, or there was another guy sort of said, Piercy, you're not drinking, hey, can you drive me home tonight? Blah, blah. So and um, so anyhow, I that for me, it was it, I, I, I could have gone down the path of just pleasing them, but I didn't um, by just drinking and, and that I don't know where that would have led to. But um, anyhow, I, I didn't and um, and thank, I'm thankful to the guys that sort of wanted the lift home because it, it gave me an excuse not to drink. <laughs> and then I became popular because I was forever known as the, the designated driver. I was very us- useful. Very useful. Did you ever – can I ask you a question? Yeah. Did you ever charge them? <laughs> No, nah, there's a guy called Gary Jack that would have charged him. Our, our <laughs> fullback, famous for being how tight, the tightest man on the planet. <laughs> there's a lad who I used to play with, and he he would have charged he char- he charged people for a lift home. Oh, so he, he was he, he was he was ahead of his time. He was the Uber ahead of his time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But li- literally, like he had to, you know, it's on his way home, <laughs> and he'd still charge them. <laughs> Paul Clough, one of the tightest. Paul yeah. Clough, his name is. He was one of. The, Can you like, say that again? Because he deserves to be yeah. be, be announced. Paul Clough, if you're watching this, <laughs> you Great. know who you are. Well done, Paul. Like, we'll he, stick you on Gary yeah. Jack in a shout. Yeah, so you get two breaks he, first. He, he used to he used to charge one of the young lads, give him a lift to training for petrol. No. Money. I swear, to, I swear, <laughs> I swear. Okay, he was he was <laughs> tight on a like an anxiety driven tight. Like he would genuinely get anxious and, and nervous ar- around any form of like well, you know, putting money into a kitty or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, well, everyone's uh, different, aren't they? they, they everyone's they sure, different. <laughs> they sure are. Um, when you're coming through at the Tigers, um, you mentioned you were studying. Is that whilst you're uh, playing? Yeah. You came through in the, the part-time yeah, so, era? So the, the, yeah, the, yeah, the full-time era didn't didn't really fully kick, on, kick in in the NRL till the Super League War hit. There were a couple of clubs that were full time in the early nineties, um, but they all went full time when the Super League war hit. And I finished my playing career at the end of nineteen ninety, so that was very much in that part time space. So, what were you doing in the? You you had a job in the day? Yeah. So, or stu- so or what happened? Uni? Yeah, you did. Yes. And back in those days, when you scored a try, it'd have your occupation on the bottom of the screen. Did it? Yeah. Occupation, that- um, policeman. Occupation, a labourer. Whatever, yeah, yeah, there's no like old player sponsor. It's just occupation. Yeah, That's occupation. Brilliant. Yeah, so if you can see the old video tapes. Oh. You'll, you'll actually see that on there, which is quite funny. So my occupation. Um, so so when I um, left. So when I left left school, and I was still before I started playing grade, I started the university course, 
that was a four year degree at New South Wales Uni. And then um, the last couple of years I, I was there, I was balancing the, the uni course with, with footy. And I was working part time actually to get a bit of money uh, when I was at uni at Balmain Lease Club. They, they um, working as a doorman up there at the, at the Lease Club and, um, and did a bit of bar work and stuff like that. So, so that was pretty cool. And then what happened was um, I, I, I got the, the, the science degree. So I was uh, then a school teacher. So I was a high school teacher for uh, two and a half years. And I started, when I started playing for Australia, it was too hard getting time off. <laughs> And then, uh, oh, and then yeah. <laughs> sorry, says, says not in today. He's just playing for the kangaroos. <laughs> got that's the what, it was, that's what yeah. it was, mate. I, I, yeah. know, I know, but it's just yeah. So, so it boggles the mind now. You had to get time off. You had to get time off for state of origin. You had to get time off for for playing for Australia. Anyhow, so then what happened? <laughs> you get knocked back. <laughs> I didn't get knocked back. But, no, uh, oh, sorry, Matt, you're going to need happened, to teach this class. <laughs> like, what's more important? I um. I, what happened was I ended up uh, – the, the Channel 10 offered me a job um, the, to um, work for them selling – basically going around schools actually. Yeah, so, so I was going around schools selling the sport to the kids, so basically talking about the value of sport and fitness and health. It was um, partly funded by Channel 10 and partly funded by Rugby League because Channel 10 were the broadcast for Rugby League back then. And I did 500 schools in three years and then um, – which basically going out to school and – and talking about the value of sport, talk to the kids, tell a few stories, sign a few autographs and go on the next school. They've got sort of game development officers that do that sort of stuff now. And then I got sort of – I got bored doing that. So then um, then they trained me to, to sell advertising. So I sold advertising for a few years as well, which gave me an insight into the corporate world, which which is where I've sort of been consulting for the last 20 years. So that that's – so when I um, – if I scored a try in the, as early as it was school teacher. What, what did you teach? Um, I, did, I taught uh, industri- well, industrial arts, uh, tech drawing and all that sort of stuff, and also um, science. So I, sci- I did a science degree. So, Sorry, so like dr- what do you mean by industrial drawing? Uh, Indus- well, that, it was, the faculty was called industrial arts back then. Now it's um, – the, the name's changed now. So which is tech, technical drawing – is that like la- not landscaping um, architect? Is that like an architect or you sort of sort of that sort of stuff? Yeah, and it, it also encompasses metalwork and woodwork as well. Um, and then there's this, there was the science aspect of it as well. So it like physics, yeah, yeah, chemistry, chemistry that sort of stuff. Yeah, 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 biology. Yeah, yeah. Mate, is there anything you can't do? You're, yeah. in a, you're playing a band as well, like. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, just gonna knock off from school early. I'm going playing for the uh, for the kangaroos, oh. and oh, I've got the band later well, on as well. well. I think you you realise that um, after you finish playing, you can actually do whatever you want to do. It's just a matter of having a passion to do it, and and the, the belief. But this is why you were still playing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is why. Yeah, yeah. But but uh, but bear in mind, I, I'd I'd sort of um, been exploring the, the potential human potential for a, for a long period of time. So. Mm. Um, Yes, yeah, so that was it's, that's, quite interesting. It's fascinating. Yeah. I, I wonder. So I'm thinking back to like, in like culture interests me, and interesting people obviously interest me as well. And I imagine you'd be a bit of a go-to as a teammate, due to your background in psychology. Did you did you have many like interesting convers? Did you have many teammates coming up to you and be like, "Piercy, I'm just actually what's what's quite funny, James, is that." Because it became it became back in those days there was no nutritionists around, yeah, and because I was I was sort of um, pioneering the way in, in with nutrition and, and preparation. Um, I was actually writing a lot of diets for for players from other clubs as well. The players that I met in rep games would say, "Junior, what do you reckon? Can you can you draft me up?" Uh, just a diet what, for me, blah blah blah. Any supplements I should take, and because back in those days supplements weren't really common or popular. Um, but yeah, so so there was it wasn't just the, my teammates in my team; it was actually from other teams as well, which was pretty cool. Yeah, so that was um, quite funny, and uh, quite a lot of them still with me nowadays about the fact you know that um, that you know I'm 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 big on taking supplements, <laughs> vitamins, and stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> Oh dear, I can um, I can only imagine some of those conversations you had and that that changing of the 
or well, sorry, not changing, but being part of that culture. Did did many try and replicate you uh, in the gym and, and with your conditioning drills? Did, like, were you you'd go and do it on your own, or did you have that contagion effect where where people would come with you? Um, yeah, there's. I had quite a few of the guys that would 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 train with me as well. Um, but bear in mind, it, it was because we all worked jobs as well. It was we had to work around. The, so the extras, like for me, it was. We do the the core footy training like three days a week, three afternoons a week, and then some players would that was it. But for me, the other times around that was when I did the extras in terms of um, my speed training, my, my weights, extra weights, um, uh, or the phosphate fitness recovery sort of training as well. So we had to work it in around what what it was that um, you, you did as work. And, I mean, the fortunate thing was for me was that the employer that I had when I was w- w- with Channel 10, they were fantastic. A guy called John Maris was the guy who who, who, who um, got me the, the role over there at Channel 10. And and he, he he was amazing in terms of, you know, because injuries, physio, you've got to go and get treatment with physio. Well, if you, some employers wouldn't let your time get time off to do that. A lot of employers did when they understood the profile that footy players had. But it was not like now where oh well the physios are just a training cool it was it was quite different yeah it's it's incredible to to think that not that long ago no it's not That's it's not the, really that long ago well it is a long while ago it's last millennium but yeah but, <laughs> but in the scheme of things yeah um it's not no it's not that long yeah it'd be interesting to see where we are um what another, in another thirty yeah. forty years That's right yeah like you know we'll look back at now yeah. You know, you yeah. believe they weren't doing that's right yeah for sure whatever comes into the future yeah, it, yeah. it will be like wow you didn't I mean, have you didn't have the vr training you didn't have the nah, that's right know, alternative reality yeah training oh well but when i mean we're talking about ai artificial intelligence now right breaking paving the way but there's also um quantum computers which no no one's talking about that yet but Quantum computers is the next phase above yeah. that that's going to come in as well well so I, you add ai and quantum computers together Wow. People don't realise the power of quantum computers. It, yeah. It's actually incredible. I've heard somebody uh, lecture about it, and it's my theory that we will have a smart field and a quantum computer will make all the decisions for us. There's um, no there doubt. There will be no such thing as a, as a referee. Yeah. Touch, I, I think touch. people are talking about um, you know cures for this, cures for that. I was going to take that. Is it, when, it's going to all happen overnight. Like yeah, we're going to we're going to have flying cars in the next within the next eight to ten years. There's going to be flying cars. No, no doubt. You heard it here. No doubt whatsoever. Whatsoever. The only thing with quantum computers are they've the the condition, the environment that they're in. It's quite they're very sensitive. Yeah. So there's they've been stuck with in the quantum computing space research wise for for a bit. They've hit a bit of a hurdle, but. Um, I've, I've been told by some people that are that are um, at the cutting edge that that there's some real breakthroughs about to happen. Yeah, they're going to move past that um, yeah. that volatility because it's like one little nudge and they yeah. lose their shit, which obviously isn't ideal when you no. when you're using them. Like they're very um, very delicate would be the best way of describing it, but if there's if there's breakthroughs happening, it's uh it's exciting, it's scary, it's a lot of different things in the wrong hands. It could be the end of yeah, civilization I mean, as we know it, but I mean, it's a volatile world in which we we live. Yeah, sure and I mean, is. ethics is a big part of it. Right? Yes, so, um, that's that's we're going to wait and see what happens. Yeah, yeah, but our ethics don't necessarily um, match up with other countries or cultures' ethics. So it's um, mm. let's get on to something more. It's interesting. interesting. Yeah, this is probably a conversation for for off the for r- others yeah. smarter than me. Yes, <laughs> yes. We're, we're, pro- it's it's not on the rundown uh, <laughs> or, or on the list. Let's Qu- not deviate. Qu- quantum computers. <laughs> we're not we're not here. And I'll, as much as I love to talk about <laughs> AI and alternative realities, yeah, we'll we'll stick to football. Well, actually, but it's funny, the, one of the guys that I actually um, do exercise. One, one of my favorite exercise now is is paddling ex- on, on a ski racing ski on the harbor yeah one of the guys i paddle with um is the go- is one of the two guys the two australian guys invented wi-fi one of those guys david skellen uh, he's a professor uh i paddle with him and he is just the most amazing I mind can, um i can only imagine some yeah, of those conversations and, and he's 
he's um, yeah just talks about the, the potential for um, the f- the future the, the near future of what what's going to unfold in terms of um, just opportunities and um, and inventions. Yeah, I'm smiling because it oh, yeah. re- it really excites me that sort of yeah. stuff. He, he invented he invented Wi-Fi. 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 Yeah. So. Um, he was working with another guy at the CSIRO at the time, and they basically uh, came up with this with this con- concept and and uh, went down this path. And and because it seems like so obvious, yeah. Does, so that does it, and it it's such a well, it's almost a necessity of the modern day life. It is. Well, I mean, you, you pretty much you, you, um, the way we communicate via wi-fi nowadays yeah. so yeah as in um we still communicate vocally but but on mass communications all done electronically yeah. mm. the old plug-in yeah uh, so the okay. dial-up modem yeah no he's, he's actually and he's really fit guy and smart travels around the world sort of lecturing and doing bits and pieces he's got a good age 72 years of 73 years of age i think he is so um yeah but very very smart yeah, very yeah. sweet. Uh, yeah, those conversations would be amazing. Um, back to your career at the Tigers, um, playing two grand finals. Um, one of the greatest grand finals of all time. Um, that's lo- well largely regarded as one of the greatest grand finals of all time against Canberra. What are your reflections um, from from that day? And then we'll go on to the one against the Bulldogs as well. Um, yeah, I was. It, it was an incredibly fast match, fast game. I think there were there were close to twenty players in that in that in that match that had played or went on to play for their country, um, representative wise. So that's probably more than you'd had seen in a state of origin match. So it was actually a really high quality um, personnel on the field, and it was a fast match. Canberra hadn't won a competition before. Um, we hadn't won a competition for for quite a long while, and um, it was yeah, it was just it was just a just a really fast game. We got out to a, to to a lead. We we're leading twelve two at half time. Um, Canberra came home strong, scored a try not long before full time. What what actually happened in that game, which which was really um, turned turned the game was was sort of. Really, uh, we were sort of in control of the game um, up until into the probably halfway through the second half, and there was a refereeing error by Bill Harrigan, um, who it was his first grand final, and uh, you mightn't admit this, but when you watch the match, what happened was one of our guys, Bruce Maguire, darted out from dummy half, and he ran to one of their guys who was offside, ran straight at him, and Harrigan surely must have meant to pen- give us the penalty, but he gave them the penalty. And I questioned him. I said, what's that for? What's that for? He said, oh, no, no, it's not in the spirit of the game. What? And, and, and I don't think it's, it, there's been another penalty ever been given for that. And so what happened was off the back of that, oh, Canberra my. got possession and they worked the, – because that was around halfway. They worked the ball up the other end of the field and, and pretty much scored and that got them back into the game, which – um, in the Heinz scheme of things, m- it made a huge difference. But but you watch if you watch the game, you'll see it quite clearly. So just to, just to clarify, Dummy Half picks it up, runs into a player that's offside, yeah. on purpose to try and yeah. win a penalty, which we see happen all the time. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And Harrigan has blown a penalty to the team in possession. Yeah, and and and, and, and referees put their hand up the wrong way, and, and and I've seen that done before, and then they'll swing around because they realise that yeah. they're pointing the wrong way, and they'll swing around in one movement. movement. But Bill didn't do that, and uh, when I questioned him, they said that's 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 what happened, and um, and and Bill's a great referee. Don't, don't yeah. get me wrong, right? Um, and a great guy. Be- we one of the best. Him, yeah, we had. He's one of the, the best of all there, time, yeah. right? But but he made a blue in this particular instance, and um, and and that was the. That was the rationale behind it, and then I haven't had the chance, but I, I would like to have asked him how many other times did you give, give a penalty for not in the spirit of the game, and it would it, it would never have happened again. I don't think any ever referee's ever done that because it's not not what what you would um, would do because we we see it happen all the time, and players players will um will do that trying to trying to get a get a penalty. Yeah. Well, 
given the cricket recently, obviously Australians are used to not playing in the spirit of the game. Right? <laughs> Spoken like a true just, Englishman, hey? Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, wow, that's that must have hurt. Yeah, so it, it, it did. It cost us, in hindsight. It, it cost it, you the cost us the game, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but, um, but it went to extra time, the match, and Canberra scored a try and um and they and they won the match and, and they they played they played really good footy. It was it was a really high quality game and yeah and and, and, and they managed to get the win in the end. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, but still Yeah, so devastating. people say, oh, you know, that I've never won a grand final. Well, that's not true. I actually won two with the Balmain Police Boys in the in the juniors. <laughs> it's better than nothing. <laughs> Absolutely it is. <laughs> um the game against the Bulldogs um, was that 88? 88 was the, was the Bulldogs. That was the year before. So, yeah. um, and you had the, you had the, my fellow countryman. Yeah, yeah Elry um, Hanley. Elry Hanley. The yeah, yeah. So, well, well, actually, to get to the grand final in 88 was a, was a, a massive effort by us uh, as a club because um, we, we finished in equal fifth spot, but there was top five in those days. And um, back in those days, if you finished level in, in the fifth spot, there wasn't a, a, a for and against differential considered. You had to play a playoff midweek, so we played off midweek. Oh, <laughs> so we played off on the Wednesday, um, and then went into we won that that playoff, and then we went into play the semi final three three days later or four days later, whatever it was. Um, then we won that, and we won each of the games through. Got to the grand final, and and um, and then Elry Hanley, who was our our Strikes and he was an, had an amazing year, Elry. Because what happened was the English toured that year, and Elry stayed on after the tour and came over and joined us mid-season. And um, and Elry was a lock, and I was a lock. So, but Elry played in the centres, and he was right centre, and he was just um, um, amazing. His strength and power, his ability to break the line out there was was phenomenal. He he was devastating. And then what happened was in the grand final. Um, Terry Land hit him high, um, and in back pretty much offload the ball, hit him high. Terry and back in those days there was um, no cameras catching the back play, so nothing really transpired. But Elry got taken off, didn't come back on for the for the rest of the match, and and that pretty much turned the game. So um, do you think Bar? Bar, yeah, did it on purpose or? Well, I can't say he did it on purpose. You know, it, it was um, he. Uh, but it was, it was pretty high, yeah. and late, and late, <laughs> and late. <laughs> oh dear. From your old club, eh? Mm. Yeah, the good, good, good fella, Terry Lamb. He's a very good fella. Yeah, very I played a lot fella. of footy with, a lot of yeah. rep footy with him. Uh, he's a really and a really tough, good player. Mm. Um, but that was um, was 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 that not a good was shot. that game defining with the pearl going off? Think oh it'd yeah, be a different story. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we made it. Made, um, in fact, if if you watch the match, you'll see not long after that. It probably three or four minutes after he, he went off, um, I made a bus on the right hand side. Came to the fullback. He was right centre. He would have been there. Would have been a try, but he wasn't there. And I sort of kicked the ball and Canterbury cl- closed it up. So it it, it would have been. Um, it, it, it was it certainly, certainly turned the match. Yeah, that one hurt as well. Yeah, it did. But well, you get over first, it. Time, first time there. Yeah, that was the first yeah. time. So that that one wasn't as bad as eighty nine. Um, because you know, that was the first time we'd been to a grand final for quite a while. Um, first time I'd been to a grand final, but and the club hadn't been for a couple of decades. But eighty nine was um, was devastating. Yeah. yeah, yeah. To lose an extra time must be yeah a horrible way. Yeah, horrible way to lose one. Um, don't worry, mate. I've had my fair share of GF yeah. losses as well. Yeah, don't worry about that. Um, mate, in in your career. You remained loyal to the Tigers. We have attempted to leave. Yeah, it's funny. There was um, only once I ever had a conversation with another club and that was with um, Jack Gibson because I had so much respect for Jack and he was coaching at Parramatta. And this was, I think this was um, was either end of 82 or 80, end of 83 and Jack rang me up and um, it's quite funny because in those days, no mobile phones. It was all landline. So he got my, my home number from somebody, I don't know who. He rang me up. Wayne, 
It's Gibson here, Jack. I hear you're off contract coming up next year. Want to meet with you. Need to have a chat. I said, oh, Jack. And I, was, I was in awe of it. Jack Gibson's ringing me. Yeah. And um, anyhow, I, I said, um, actually, no, it was the end of 81. It was before I played for Australia. Yeah, it was before I played for Australia. I think it was 81, yeah. Anyhow, Jack, um, he says, uh, we need to meet. I'll have a black Land Rover. We'll meet in the car park at Parramatta Leeds Club. Just pull up next to me. Hop in my car. We'll have a chat. No one will know about it. So so I pulled up next to this black black Land Rover, got out, go and sat in the car. It looked like a drug deal for some bunch of other people. I didn't know, right? <laughs> and um, I'm sitting in the car and, and Jack's got his big coat on and we're chatting away and and he was – we just had a, a good chat and he talked about what he was – doing at the club and, and what the club with direct tra- trajectory was and that Ray Price was playing lock but I could play second row and we'd make a, 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 an awesome combination together, blah, blah, blah. Um, and got out and I think Jack and and then went home. But when I had to think about it, I just, I just my heart wasn't anywhere other than the Tigers. So, um, so, that, so, yeah, I was, wanted to stay at the Tigers and that was it. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was actually in hindsight. I'm pretty sure it was before I went on the kangaroo tour, so it was 80, end of '81, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I think you, your loyalty is is very respected by your by your former teammates, and a big reason why they why a lot of um, them stayed. I, I mean, the, the, the pretty much that team that we had and the bond that we had amongst us, no one left the club. Like there was just no one wanted to leave. There wasn't sort of the oh, there wasn't the massive money that there is now as well. Like there was money, you you got yeah you know, more than the average wage playing, playing footy, but there wasn't that temptation of money as well. But but the the thing was that the guys that played in in, in those teams through the eighties, we all had this amazing bond, and and none of us wanted to leave. Some of us left. Not when I say some of us, I didn't, but some of the guys left because they got. Um, you know, much bigger offers elsewhere. Not, um, and the, all, all the opportunities were, were were better somewhere else for them because they were up and down out of reserve grade. But of the top players that played rep footy, and none of them, none of us really left. And um, it was, uh, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, just a great vibe, great bond. I mean, you know what it's like in yeah. a, in, a, in a footy club. You know that when you when you've got a really good vibe, you don't want to. You feel guilty if you if you let your mates down by leaving. Yeah. You know? And it, it's not a risk worth taking, is it? Because when when things are so good and you've got that great environment, yeah. What value do you put on on happiness and, and camaraderie and, and and morale and stuff like that? I mean, it's it's um, yeah, it's it's just great feeling. Mm. Other than the the meeting with Jack Gibson, was there any like other requests or ever like a, a phone call or? Because um, I, yeah, I yeah, imagine I had, you I had, would have been a hot commodity, but obviously you took it to a stage where you, you, you met I with Jack a, Gibson, but there'd be phone calls and feelers put out. I'm yeah, assuming. there was. There was. It was. Um, there was another guy um, whom I who was who expressed an interest. A guy called Laurie Fryer went and coached at Eastern Suburbs um, in the sort of mid 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 eighties, maybe towards the end of the late eighties, I think. But um, and and Laurie. Um, wanted me to go over to the Roosters and and um, I, I I I didn't I didn't want to leave the club yeah so I didn't even, I didn't even pursue any conversations yeah it was just thanks but yeah, no yeah. thanks and, and and Laurie's was was a good fellow good coach as well yeah yeah pretty admirable that, to just be as loyal as you were to the Tigers yeah um, I'm a bit I, as I said back then it was it was that there wasn't the change of clubs like there is now, and they, you know, no one broke their contracts, for example, right? Yeah. And I mean, I, I pretty much through my career, I, I had a, I had contracts, but I didn't sign the contracts up front. I say, we'll get around to signing that when you get it all done, all that sort of stuff, and and um, I, you know, that your word was your bond. Now, sort of, not quite the same. No, it's very different. Yeah, very different. Um, we'll come back and we'll we'll touch on um some of your rep career but when you finish at the Tigers you move into coaching why 
Um, I I didn't really think about going into coaching um, when I finished my playing career. Uh, and the, I, when I finished my playing career, it was end of 1990 and Warren Ryan was the coach. He finished coaching the Tigers when I finished playing and then Alan Jones came over, took on a took on the coaching role in uh, 1991 and Alan um, had, had enormous success with with the the uh, Warata, with the um, um, the rugby union with with, with Australia and the rugby union and then what happened was when he came over to the to, to the Tigers he wanted me because I, I just stepped down wanted me to be um, he said can you come and you down to training and give us some hand with assistance and stuff like that but I I didn't really have um, – I felt it, I felt out of place doing that and I needed a break. And then I went and did some commentary with Channel 10, whom I was employed with, but I was also doing um, – selling advertising. And then what happened was uh, John Chalk gave me a call. He was the chairman of the club and gave me a call um, at pretty much the back end of 1993 and um, – he asked me, "Was I would I be interested in coaching the club because the club uh, wasn't going that well, wasn't wasn't performing too, very well?" And I had to think about it, chatted to some confidants that I um, valued their opinion, and, and I thought, "Well, yeah, I, I, I think I, I I need to have a crack at this," and that was how it came about. But it wasn't something that I thought about for a long period of time, or or had a, a desire to do at some point. But I'm glad I stepped into that role, albeit that the club was, was a, it wasn't was wasn't performing very well when I moved into the role because I learned um, a whole different perspective on, on um, people management um, because as a player, captain, the leadership role is on the field is follow me guys, let's go, we're going to do this. Um, whereas from a coaching perspective, it's much more about getting inside their heads because you're sitting up in the box and you've got to work out what in, how to inspire different types of people and, and um, from a perspective of, uh, of them being motivated without you being there to yell at them and encourage them and so on and so forth. So it was incredibly valuable uh, as, a, as, a, as a skill set. Could I have done things better? Absolutely. Um, but I felt I grew enormously through those early years of coaching. I coached for seven seasons. Um, those first couple of years were a real battle, but after that it started It started to become more of a uh, – things started to flow. So you, you were coaching there during the Super League War, right? Yeah, yeah, that was pretty, I was, pretty hard. So I've heard a lot of it from a player's perspective, a lot of money coming into the game, you know, friendships, split – loyalty, all that sort of stuff. What was it like as a coach during that time, during that period? Um, it was very difficult, yeah, because of the instability. Um, it was also difficult for us as a club at the Tigers because um, we the, 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 the um, players that were signed to the NRL, they were that, that were signed by the NRL to contracts. Uh, they called them loyalty contracts. Well, you really need to, to buy – Pay some money for loyalty. That was my issue. Um, so the the players <laughs> yeah, were it's kind of ironic, though. <laughs> yeah, I know. And you know the players um, that were assigned to clubs. Well, we we really didn't get any quality players as, as far as the clubs were concerned. So we were we were significantly disadvantaged as a club. Um, just the, unfortunately, the way it worked, and that made it a, a, a real struggle. But. From, but one of the challenges that, that I had was ethically um, was a, around the fact that um, that you had to pay these players so th this this amount of money for their loyalty. That, but the the positive that came out of the Super League War was that the fact that um, the players' salaries increased markedly, and and there were, because there was more money coming into the game. And now that set a benchmark and the games never really looked back from that. And players' um, remuneration increased massively as a result of what happened and the war between Rupert Murdoch and, and, and Kerry Packer, which is ultimately what it was about, pay television. It was all about pay television. 
Did you feel like a bit of a pawn in amongst that fight between? No, I, I, no, I didn't feel like that. I don't, I don't know if the players felt like that either. But um, it, it was just incredibly destabilizing because we all knew anyone that had any brains knew that this is not sustainable because there was there was all these extra teams that were formed as a, as a result. There were two competitions running side by side. It wasn't sustainable. And um, Rupert Murdoch and, and Kerry Packer shook hands. 12 months after, 18 months afterwards, whatever it was, and and uh, agreed to um, to bring the game back together. But there was a lot of carnage as a result of that. Um, South Sydney were were um, end up marching in the streets because they were going to get kicked out of the competition. Um, we at the at Balmain um, made the decision <coughs> that we would uh, join with Western Suburbs in the in the in the joint venture. Were you part of that conversation? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Because the um, the, the Tigers' uh, finances were were um, were very were quite stretched as a con- as a result of that Super League war, and um, <coughs> we, we we as a club had options as to who because because there were the Eels actually were qu- quite interested in in Parramatta uh, because they they. They thought that the brand, the Tigers, was a very attractive brand. So they were happy, wanted to be become the Parramatta Tigers. But, wow. but the um, the it would, it, would, it would have been pretty much a takeover rather than a than a joint venture if that had had to happen because they had a lot of more, lot more financial resources and and um, there would have been some inequity in the way I think that that would have transpired. So there were and there were a couple of other nibbles from other clubs as well but west western suburbs were culturally um i think the best fit and um in the end within a relatively short period of time they won the competition you know so the joint venture started in 1999 and they won the competition in 2005 um so you know it 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 was quite a successful joint venture to begin with to begin with, yeah. <laughs> so we're struggling a little bit at the moment, yeah. Just let me get this straight. You as a coach, you're coaching the Balmain Tigers. You then merge with um, Western... Yeah, so I, I had to coach... So I coached the, the Balmain Tigers yeah. for for six years and um, and then and then, then, you, I, then I coached the, the joint venture for the yeah. first year. But then do you get all those players... I had to bring in? them all together. And I had to cut half the playing staff. Had to cut half the co- half the coaching staff. Had to work with uh, the boards back then. There was a lot of tension between the boards as well. It was. Uh, I actually signed a three year deal in two thousand, but it burnt me out after one year. And really? So I, I got out of and coaching. And that was the the, the off field stuff. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. What, what were you having? Oh well, to do? it was it was it was off field and and. Well, but yeah, off off field in, in in terms of it was quite it was quite difficult to to sack players like the, the you know a lot of these players are not going to get another club um, coaching staff had, had to get get rid of a lot of the coaching staff because you're bringing two clubs into one um, and that's on you to make that call. Absolutely, or did you have yeah. a team yeah. of people around you. Oh, ultimately, come back then, come back to the head coach. Yeah, I mean, yes, we had had. Um, team of people around but um, it's on you yeah but the coach you get pressure from the board to be 50 50 on your say coaching stuff split no no there's no pressure like that no there's no pressure pressure in terms of um um making it a 50 50 to balance it out because of the politics of it no there was nothing like that but it was it was still quite um yeah quite demanding and and draining so Uh, so that was the it was the the emotion of basically. And, well, and it was a time as well because whilst now the coaching staffs are quite large, you got like, quite they've got quite a lot of resources. Back then we didn't have a lot of resources. We had we um we had a fairly thin uh, line of a small number of, of coaching staff. So I, you know, I was required to do a lot more than what coaches, head coaches are now, and it, and it pretty much burnt me out. And in fact, I wasn't spending any time with with my my um, enough time with my my family, young kids growing up, 
and and what was the turning point was halfway through the season in 2000 and, and we, as it we were actually we were in the eight just on the edge of the eight um and i got i i, I was pressured to uh, i the, just the workload was was massive yeah and mm. what happened was this particular day I, I headed off to work which is the office at, uh, and i'm driving to to the office and halfway to the office and because I, I was heading off at 6 30 a.m in the morning and coming home at 7 30 8 o'clock at night and i've got little kids it just and my head was such that i just really wanted to do this job and i, I got my life out of balance and my youngest daughter hannah who was only um she would have been um uh, back in 2000 she would have been um, eight years of age so she rang me and she had a running carnival on this day a zone running carnival which is the district running carnival and the school carnival i couldn't make it because it was something more important with the footy training came up and i said if you make it to the district i'll come along anyhow this particular day something urgent came up that i had to be at to attend so i've headed out early in the morning which meant i couldn't get to the to a running carnival so she got up in the morning and said to my wife where's daddy my wife said oh he's gone to training so she's rung me on the phone crying on the phone because i couldn't go i had to pull into a service station on the way and just park there to try and settle my head and i made a decision in the car then that i was going to quit coaching at the end of the year um, because i just that was the wake-up call that i had that got me to um to the point where i realized that like my life was out of balance so then i sort of didn't tell anybody and it wasn't until after the last match of this of the season that i went and saw the chairman the next day after the match and gave him the news that i was i wasn't going to coach anymore i had another choose on my contract but and i told him the story and he turned around and john Ch john chalk lovely guy really really good 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 chairman for the club and he started walking away and and i said and i just yelled out to him and he turned around and come back and said yeah i get you i understand where you're coming from and um and that was it and then i sort of told the players and and um and i didn't know what i was going to do but i knew that i had to do something that was going to get my life into balance and 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 i had to spend a lot more time with with the kids with my kids who were growing up uh quicker than i really realized yeah, yeah. but coaching coaching is such a demanding job and you see a lot of coaches that that are in it, get caught in that vortex where they don't understand that um that it, it, it's it's going to unless you you get balance it's going to cause problems n not just in relationships with your family and friends but in terms of your health because it's incredibly stressful if you don't manage it correctly oh it, n no doubt every coach out there is reducing their um health span yeah by coaching yeah yeah there's elements of it that would increase it but overall i would say it, it's a decrease on health span and lifespan no. to get to enter the field of coaching. I think so, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, you see some coaches that, you know, they're sort of, um, they're so worked up and you think oh, you're going to end up with PTSD or something like that because the it's that, it's that cycle, weekly cycle during the season where you have a couple of days let down but then it's then it's all this tension and, and, and stress and, and um dysfunctional health yeah so like and some people are attracted to the chaos and the madness of it all yeah but it's not good for you nah it's, i i i mean some coaches think what well, what else am i going to do well when you have a look at the skill set you've acquired and built and and um developed then i think they don't there's a whole there's a whole other world out there there's a, there's a lot of high profile jobs like that like ceos board members of like big companies people think mm. oh love yeah. to do that yeah and, uh, yeah i don't know yeah don't know what, don't know if you want to be on call that's you know, right 24 yeah. hours a day seven days a week 365 days a year yeah. i don't know i don't know if you never really have the ability to be present mm. in conversations with your loved ones like yeah. that's what it is and yeah you see some some of them and they that yeah. you'll chat with them and they are not present they no. are thinking about a player coming off contract a potential recruitment 
what happened at training that day, a play the opposition have done in the past three weeks. They yeah, are just, or there's an incident with the player off the field somewhere and you get sucked into that. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, could yeah. even be in the juniors. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. What are we going to do? Yeah. Yeah. Failed drug test. Yeah. You know, a, a star player has gone down with a, an injury at training. It's yeah. like it's just never-ending stress. You'd, no. you'd never sleep easy. <laughs> and, and and the thing is, the big difference between like a CEO's role, for example, and, and a footy coach is that the CEO doesn't get put on under the microscope um, in terms of the media and scrutiny every week. They might get when when the at the end of the financial year they might get questioned about the um, performance on mm. uh, share price. But um, the footy coach, head coach, gets put under scrutiny every week. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, every day actually. Good, good, good on them, good on them for doing yeah. that. Um, with the just with the just lastly on the. The, the Super League war and what it did for players and with the finances that come into the game. What about for coaches? Was there a big re- rise in, in wages? And, and then also going from part-time to full-time, I imagine that you would have relished that. Yeah. Well, the coaching role was full-time. Um, but, the, I mean, dealing with the, the players. Oh, a yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. So you as, the, you as the coach being to – oversee yeah. a full time it would have been a huge change yeah, no, for a lot of players. Yeah. But I imagine you would have like really Yeah. No, you're exactly re- really right. enjoyed that. It was it was that was a luxury. Yeah. Yeah. Because some clubs were previous when the so when the Super League war hit in <coughs> excuse me, ninety five, um some clubs prior to that had been full time. Like the Broncos, for example, were, were full time prior to that. Um but now but everyone was on the same level playing field when, when all the clubs went went full time. Yeah, and so that there were some positives for sure, <clears throat> but there were the Super League didn't hit, live up to the hype. You know, it was going to take rugby league to China and India and stuff like that, which part of the the that was part of the advertising campaign, but it um, didn't quite live up to those expectations. But there were some good to come out of it for sure. Mm. But so as a, as a coach, was the change in the, the finances of a coach or it was just um the coaching no nah, the, there wasn't much in the way of coach some some of the coaches uh and and i i got offered a a um a loyalty payment um by got by graham richardson and graham richardson um was a he was a politician but he was um he was seconded to the nrl to um to work with I mean, there might have been oh, there's a couple other people he was working with to to sign players and coaches, and I said to Graham, he offered me a figure. I can't remember exactly what the figure was, and and I said I I don't need a loyalty payment. I oh, said, you knocked it back. I knocked it back. Yeah, and Graham would know this. Um, I'm sure he remember it. Um, and it was um, for me. The, you, you, if I had a, had to call it something else, but other than a loyalty payment, but they're all referred to as loyalty payments. Yeah. What what are we talking like? A couple of like I, six figures. I can't remember. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I, but I can't remember. Wow. What, I can't rem- remember. But if it had been named something different, yeah. Well, like, it, it was just the principle of it. You know, yeah. It, it, it was, this is to stop stop you from going to the Super League. This is an uh, an it wasn't NRL then. It was ARL. Yeah. ARL. Um, you just didn't like the phrase. Well, I just didn't like the concept. You know, I, did, I just think it was unnecessary. Yeah. Yeah. So. It's um it's pretty yeah, impressive. interesting. Yeah. It was interesting. It was uh, it's no, it's yeah, very impressive. Speaks a lot about you. About yeah, just I'm just I'm I'm I am i do not know. I'm I'm sure there are other probably other players or coaches that well not about players, but the, the other coaches that <laughs> 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 Yeah, other coaches. No, uh, no, nah, nah, <laughs> not not the players. <laughs> no, I'm gonna keep on this uh yeah, um, bargain basement contract. But now Graham Graham um yeah, and he was he was um, very respectful, and 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 because I just said I said I'm not going anywhere else. I'm, I don't I don't want to leave the club. I don't want to leave the ARL, and that was it. Happy days. We're going to take a quick break from the podcast to tell you about AG One, the daily foundational nutritional drink with all your needs in the one place. I like to look after my health, and AG One takes care of that for me. No more tablets, vitamin pills, vitamin pills. All the health nutrition I need, all in the one place. Every single morning, it's as easy. Open up the fridge, 
scoop of AG1 in a glass, cold water, stir it with a fork, drink it. It tastes great and it helps me know. It gives me the peace of mind that all my nutritional needs are taken care of all in the one drink. It really is as simple as that. And also anybody that knows anything about health benefits knows that it comes with adding simple routines to your day. It's not about magic pills. They're not going to work. AG1 helps me be the best version of myself by having this new habit of every single morning having that drink. I know my nutritional bases are covered thanks to AG1. A lot of athletes are now taking AG1 and with 75 high quality ingredients, it's no wonder why. If a comprehensive solution is what you need from your supplement routine, then try AG1 and get a free one year supply of vitamin D and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com forward slash buy round. That's drinkag1.com forward slash buy round. Check it out. On to your rep career. You, um, you come back as the MVP of the Invincibles in 1982. Was it the pinnacle for you to play for the Kangaroos? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, in '82, our the coach of the, my coach, coach at the club level, Frank Stanton, was also the coach of the Kangaroos. And all year, and and I played, uh, I played in the city rep teams at the start of the season, and I had a had a pretty good season at the club, but we didn't make the finals. Um, and Frank Stanton, our coach did not say a word to me all year about the about the kangaroos because he wanted me to stay focused obviously on the tigers didn't tell me i was on the radar or anything like that so as we got to the back end of the footy season and we were way we weren't going to make the finals the team organized a uh, a trip to hawaii for end of season trip i'd never been to hawaii so i thought i'm going to hawaii not thinking i'll be on the kangaroos squad so and Frank had never said anything to me about it, so I booked the trip to Hawaii. And then on grand final, so they announced the grand, the Kangaroos team on grand final night. So our reserve grade team played in the grand final, won the grand final um, on that particular year. So we're all at the club after the game celebrating the reserve grade team. And um, what happened was Frank came over to me with this smile on his face whispered in my ear, he said, you're on the, you're on the camp playing for the kangaroos. I said, what? He said, you're, playing, you're, in the camp for the, you're going away for the kangaroos for three months with me. And I, I just froze. I just couldn't believe it. And then um, Frank announced it to, the, to everybody. Everybody cheered. And, and uh, so I had to find somebody to, to, to actually buy my tickets to go to Hawaii for the trip in <laughs> Hawaii because I'm going to, to England instead. And uh, it was the most amazing experience. Like it was just um, just a real – the highlight of my career, the most enjoyable period of my whole career was, was that period over there, uh, except for the snoring of my roommate Peter Sterling. He was, he was a bit of a snorer, but that's, really? that's okay. I put up with that. Mm. But, um, Were you away for three months? Sorry? Was it, th was it a three-month Yeah, month no, 11 weeks. Wow. 11 weeks. So he played 20 – I think it was 22 games. So we played three tests against England, two tests against France, and then we played a whole lot of the club sides mm. uh, in between. They took away – in those days, they took away 28 players. So you basically had two teams um, and they'd rotate around. And then after the first first few matches, they became two, two, two teams within the squad. So you'd have the, the Kangaroos and the Emus, which are on either side of the emblem. So the Emus were the number two team. That played mostly against the the club sides, and then the kangaroos were the test side. Yeah, and um, yeah, it was it was just just an awesome experience, and to and to get voted um, the players' player on that tour for me was just I was just mind blowing. Yeah, yeah, yeah I bet. Yeah, yeah it I was. Bet. Is that is that what you look back on and, and smile about being being that type of player that we voted the most valuable player? You know, even now. You know, we, we spoke to Blocker Roach and he's like, man, like you, you would just, he holds you in such high regard. He still, you still have teammates call you now for advices. 
Yeah, I, I think the the the, the most for me the most um, the war, the award that I hold most highest is the is the ones that are given by the players, the players' player awards, because they're the ones that are out there on the field and they're judging you for for your contribution to the team in their eyes. So. Um, without a doubt, yeah, and I, I, I dare say, you probably being a player, you probably feel the same yeah, way. Absolutely, yeah. So, um, yeah, so that was that was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so, were you a, a roommate with Stello the whole time? Yeah, yeah. And, and Stello was um, was an amazing guy to have on that on that tour because um, he he was a good balance for me because he's sort of a bit more laid back, whereas I'm sort of pretty mm. sort of yeah. He, um he didn't enjoy your skipping, did he? No, no, he didn't. So I used to warm up in the morning. I get up and I do you know, 10 minutes of skipping. And um, anyhow, it only lasted for about maybe a week. Um, and then I came home this day and him, I think it must have been Ray Price who was in the next room, both of them cut my skipping rope into 100 pieces. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, um, so you just – Come back into your room and that was all. This, there was just all, they left it strategically placed right in front of the door, so I couldn't miss it. All these little mm. pieces on the ground uh, in front of the in front of the door. Anyhow, but I had a laugh and and um, I took the hint. So I got another, <laughs> I got another rope. We just skipped out in the hot corridor after that. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't cut the one up there outside. Oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> one weekend, bad enough of this. So you just wake Stella up, just <laughs> I, but, yeah. But Stella was also like I, I was. I like to get early nights and get up early. Sterlo's the opposite. He, he's, his body clock is such that he has late nights and he sleeps in. Mm. And, and anyhow, it's um, – yeah, so we came to a compromise, so I skipped outside then. That was okay. <laughs> Fair enough. How did, how did you go on, on those tours? Um, again, we hear some tales, lots of drinking involved. You yeah, just, but at that point, and I, no designated driver needed on a tour. No, that's right. No, exactly. They got a bus designated yeah. bus driver. Uh, at that particular point, you know, given that I'd um, I'd established myself with the club, and this was like, so my first year with the club was eighty, so eighty, eighty one, eighty two, I'd already got into a rhythm where players accepted that I was weird and I didn't drink, and. Um, that, so there was no pressure on me to because it was well known yeah, it was that just, I was this weirdo. There's just one weirdo that's in the team, doesn't drink, but just we'll put him aside. And uh, how we, you, you know, you said you, you know, you'd write meal plans and and fitness diaries for 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 other teammates, but did you get was was there a player in particular that would like ridicule, hammer you? Yeah, I always think back like people that are different. They just yeah, no, they didn't. They they. they I didn't have anybody like that. Like it was quite weird. Mm. I mean, a lot of people, plenty of players, I'm sure, didn't didn't agree with me and thought I was I was just weird. But none of them, none of them ridiculed me to the point where where I felt as though, um, you yeah, know, they were disrespectful. Mm. No, yeah, didn't. it was just all friendly. Yeah, yeah, friendly it was just banter. banter. Yeah, just banter. Yeah, friendly. Pierce is just weird. Don't worry about yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I imagine those tours were. Just so much fun, especially when you're winning. Yeah, like. yeah, yeah. That 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 particular one because we were the first tour, and the '82 tour we were the first touring side ever, I think, in any sport on an extended tour to go through and win every match undefeated. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and that was when you know Great Britain against Australia, like that was a big deal. Like it was. It, it's if there was an Ashes now in rugby league, it's. Mm. Uh, yeah, the inter- unfortunately, it's but the just- funny thing was the English had this belief, and they'd say this over there that you guys are full, you, you guys are professional, but we weren't. We were actually part time working jobs, but they believed that we we're professional because we had this more professional approach. Uh, and I think that was one of the one of their downfalls is that they actually saw us as be- being advantaged because we were professional, but we actually weren't. And a number of the players w- w- that I'd spoken to on the tour over there believed that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, which is quite interesting. Interesting um, psychological battle. That yeah, it is. And yeah. belief and, and, what, and what what you know to be true versus what you think is correct. true. Correct. And Frank Stanton, our coach, took advantage of that because yeah. he talked about the professional approach that we had and blah, 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 blah. And, well, and even in like the look. Yeah, that's true. How you look. 
can yeah you know it can falsify who you actually are but Absolutely. It can, you, know, you can portray an image of being yeah professional yeah, definitely it's definitely yeah crazy how the mind works it just it is. and that's that part of that slight edge we walk out and we all have our tracks zipped up to yeah. the top you know we turn up what we turn up to the game in mm. can, can all make a, a difference yeah and it, it can put seeds of doubt there yeah. if, if you're on the on the on the receiving mm. end of absolutely that, that image yeah mm. absolutely you can um but yeah amazing time in 82 86 I believe you failed the fitness test at Redfern Oval due to the conditions. Yeah, it's still of the- a sore point. Um, still a sore point. So what happened was um, we played a, a mid, mid-year. Uh, we played mid-year tests against the Kiwis, and in one of those tests, the last test actually at um, it was Lang Park in those days, which is now Suncorp. Um, we I, I picked up a, a, a loose ball and took off. And two guys, Olsen Filipana, who was a big 5'8", and, and Mark Graham, who was a huge um, um, lock to play for the New Zealand, Captain New Zealand. Both of these guys hit me at the same time and I landed on my knee and, uh, and I couldn't get up. And any other the, the trainer came on and, and they helped me off the field. And the, the doctor at the time, um, and they, back in those days, they didn't have sports doctors. It was basically a GP. Um, he had a look at it and sort of said um, that he, he thought it was a, a cartilage. So I came back to a, that cartilage injury and I should go, he'll recommend somebody, went to saw, saw this particular doctor who had a look at the, had a, dip, operated on me and I came out of the operation and the doctor didn't, um, said I didn't actually operate, I didn't actually do the full operation because you haven't actually done your cartilage, you've done, you've torn your anterior cruciate and because he told me if I did the cartilage, it was going to be out for a couple of few weeks, probably six, four weeks, and then I'll be back. Um, they'd trim it up and be back. But because it was, I tore the anterior cruciate, he said, you're going to be out for 12 months. So uh, I was shattered because the kangaroo tour was coming up at the end of the season because every four years they had the kangaroo tour. It was 82 and this is 86. And I loved the previous tour. So I thought, oh. So I had a press conference the next day made an announcement that I was going to be out for 12 months. And um, I think that's probably the worst thing I did because what happened was probably – it was the worst thing I did. But the next day I got a call from Alan Jones. I never met Alan. And Alan does an amazing amount of, of good stuff to try and help people out. And Alan um, rang me in, at home, got my number. I don't know if got my number. He says, Alan Jones here, Wayne. He said, um, I heard yesterday you – you um, announced you're going to be out for 12 months with a knee injury. He said, I've spoken to Dr. Mervyn Cross. He's the best knee surgeon in the country. Um, he said to me, you would, someone of your, your uh, fitness will never, wouldn't, wouldn't be out for 12 months. He said, it would be much quicker than that, in, in maximum six months. He said, would you, would, it be, would you like to put me to put you in touch with him to, to, um, to have a consultation? I said, yeah. So I went and saw Mervyn. He had... Put me in for the operate, did the operation. When I when he operated on me and I came out of out of the surgery, when I sort of came we regained consciousness, he came to me and said, You're blessed. I said, Why is that? He said, The way you've torn your cruciate, normally when you tear a cruciate, you'll tear it in the middle. He said, You've actually ripped it off the bone intact with a bit of bone. So it's like a broken bone. So we stapled the bone back, we did it an encircling procedure, put another bit of ligament around it. But the actual ligament's intact, so the recovery is not like a, a, a typical. He said this is like one in ten or one in twenty people have it like this. So he said, "When's that kangaroo tour leave?" I said, um, "I think it's twelve, about twelve weeks." He said, "We'll have you back in back and running in, um, in in ten weeks." And I think if you do all the physio and do all the rehab that that we, we plan for you, um, then I think you're a good chance of the tour. So I was back training with, and back in those days they used to have train on squads. So teams that dropped out of the finals would come together and train so they'd stay fit because they weren't playing matches. So I joined the train on squad two weeks before the team was selected. And uh, and I'm and I and I pretty much straight away was leading all the runs and fitness and lots of stuff and and no problems with the knee. 
And then what happened was um, I get a call never before in the history of the game has there been a medical before the team selected. Yeah. So I get a call before the team is selected um, to go – that I had to go to Red for an Oval for a fitness test. And I had no problems because the day before I've just finished the training with the team and all this stuff. So I get over to Red for an Oval uh, for the fitness test and – Normally, the fitness test, there's some cones there. You, you'll be to sidestepping, do a few sprints. And that's it. I get there and there's Martin Bella and Les Davidson there, two massive big guys uh, that were current uh, internationals, yeah? And I said, uh, well, you guys got to do fitness tests as well. No, no, we're here because you, you've got to tackle us and, and, and um, we're going to tackle you. Okay, and wrestle you. So oh, that's all right, no problems. So I do all the wrestling, tackling, do all that sort of stuff. It's, it's going on for like 25 minutes. Just keep going, 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 going. And then at the end of the fitness test, I had to run over Red Crown Oval, which was really rough and hard at the end of the season. I had to do a 100-meter sprint. And so, bang, I took off for the sprint and, and there was a bit of a rough patch that not the leg I got operated on, the other leg sort of hit a bit of a divot and sort of just buckled a little bit, kept running. And the doctor... Monaghan, his name is, Bill Monaghan, calls me over and says, you failed the fitness test. Now, the doctor, this doctor, who was the lead doctor, did not even consult the surgeon who operated on me, who's the number one knee surgeon in the country, to ask him about my, my operation on my knee surgery or whatever uh, and the rehab. So he says, your knee's no good, you're out. But it was actually, and you can see on the vision, that it was the actual other, other knee anyway that it, it, it had hit the, the, the divot. Anyhow, there's nothing I could say. I was ruled out, and that was that was the end of it. So, I mean, I've I've, I've got my suspicions as to why why this happened, but um, one of the reasons that I wanted to join the, the rugby league commission when when it, when I joined it was because um, you know I, I I wanted to process this through, through through the game to be transparent um, and be really. Uh, fair in, in, in a whole range of matters. And, and that particular incident back in 86 had a sour taste in, in my mouth because um, I, I have suspicions as to what, what happened, what transpired. But um, Can you um, explain what you think the motivation was? Not really. Can I make an educated guess and go, he was doing it so somebody else got into the team? That's your educated guess. Okay. All right. Cool. That's so. That's that's that yeah. was um, that 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 was my experience back then. But I mean, the fact is that that you, you, if the number one surgeon in the country is not even asked, got their opinion, mm. uh, and then the first pre- time in the history yeah. of the game ever someone's required their fitness test before the team yeah. selected. Yeah, you smell a rat, don't you? Oh yeah. 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 Um, yeah, it sounds like it was predetermined or premeditated. Yeah, I, I, I really, um, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, long time ago now. Yes. And, and no but one else cares, but now but, but we moved no, on pe- from that. People do. People, yeah, I and mean, it's, the and, thing it's, is, and it's and and you know what though? You know, what I admire about you is that you don't play a victim in this. You look to ch- you look to make positive change. Yeah, I mean, I think that's all you can do. Yeah. yeah. Well, n- some people would. Yeah, some people choose not to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. admire that. Um, it wasn't just Australia, though. It was state of origin, C- clean sweep as a player and as a coach. It's pretty impressive. Guess I'm lucky. <laughs> oh shit! <laughs> I was in the right place at the right time. Yeah, that, yeah, that old. Yeah. Um, um, how, it, how, how was how was it? Firstly, as a as a player. Playing for the Blues, yeah, Origin. Origin was just an amazing uh, experience to be part of that growth of Origin. Yeah, because had humble beginnings back in 1980, where there's only one one game played at, at um, Lang Park, and then when I came in, so I didn't play. I played for Australia before I played Origin, so I played for Australia in '82, went on the tour, and then the next year played Origin, and then Queensland had won those those first couple of years. 83, they won. 84, Queensland won again. And then 85, I was fortunate to be part of that 
the first winning New South Wales team and that was the first time we actually went into a full camp. Okay, so what happened was before that um, we only went into a couple of days camp as a New South Wales team. The Queenslanders had a longer camp preparation. But that in, in 85 um, we actually went, had, a, had the luxury of a, of a full camp and, and gave us a much better preparation and, 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 we, and we won. Steve Morton was the skipper, did a fantastic job. And then Steve Mortimer Turvey, his nickname was, he actually retired at the end of the year and at the end of that, sorry, from, from origin footy, rep footy. And then um, I took over as skipper in, in 86 and that's when we won 3-0. So that was an amazing uh, experience, yeah. Yeah, I bet it was. I bet it was. And then you, you replicate it as a coach. Yeah. How, so How I'll, did you find co- coaching the, the state of origin? Again, those camps, a lot of um, – team bonding around, yeah. around alcohol was that a compromise on your values or you would yeah so you'd... i was the first uh first coach to sort of origin coach to sort of cut back on the sort of um the they still drank alcohol but there wasn't the pub crawls and that sort of stuff so we sort of uh, i had this great great idea you know that we we we, we go out of sydney and and um, we go up to the Blue Mountains. We'll have it to an eco lodge up there, and and yeah, they have a drink, but away from the public. Um, no no issues, no dramas. And then the next day, I thought, well, let's go for horse riding. So um, a, a do an activity. So I not I should no. I thought we'll, we'll get the guys to think about what sort of activity we want to do together, sort of get them bonding. And um, anyhow, they sort of they decided we go horse riding. So we we organised this horse riding trip and. And uh, didn't turn out too flash. <laughs> what happened was, a um, couple of the guys couldn't ride, and anyhow, they mounted horses that were a little bit beyond their ability. And um, anyhow, a couple of them fell off and and um, got injured. Which Brad Clyde was one. He probably Clyde. He probably talk, talked about that, did he? Yes. He did. And um, the other one was Robbie Kearns from from the Melbourne Storm. And um, I felt so so bad about that and um anyhow it was it was uh wasn't a good preparation for the for the um for the state of origin but we ended up getting that year we ended up having a drawn series first ever drawn series so um that was that and having lost the t- the previous year um with two home games this year we had two away games and we managed to get a drawn series so it wasn't as bad off the back of the drama that we had it wasn't too bad but then we went into the next year 2000 we had two games at home and that's when we won three nil and it was um yeah great great experience great to be part of going back to that that drawn series and the horse riding incident do people fo- focus too much on the outcome rather than the process because the process perhaps was right well the, do, do, do you know what i'm trying to say absolutely like we, yeah. we, we, we often go oh well Result happens, mm. we reverse engineer it and go, well, that must be wrong. Yeah. Because we've not got the desired outcome, but it was the right thing to do to get people away and do the horse yeah. riding, something a little bit different, a different form of bonding, but it had a negative outcome, mm. but it was probably the right thing to do. Yeah, yeah. I think, well, actually, to your point, you know, the media lead up to it was, this is great. You know, this is good. Everything's positive about it. We invited the media along. To actually the, the horse riding thing as uh, uh, day, so the cameras were there rolling when a couple of the guys oh. fell off, you know. So that was the the down the downside of it. But um, but yeah, but Origin, I think that was probably somewhat of a turning point because Origin from that point on definitely got a lot more um, a lot more focused on that. You don't have to get really uh, you know sort of drunk to actually have a, a really good time. And um, it was interesting. Not needless to say, in two thousand, we didn't actually go do any horse riding. We, we I think we walked up over the Harbour Bridge or something yeah. like that. <laughs> Someone <laughs> fell off. Oh. Yeah, no. <laughs> they were wide, very, yeah. they were wide to the to the safety net. Just double, double, <laughs> double. Everyone's got double safety gear on. We can't afford for anything to go wrong. Oh dear. Where, where do you think the Blues are at at the moment? Um, just. We're watching them play. The I mean, the, the thing with State of Origin is that it's there's not much between the teams, it, and that we saw that in this year's series. 
Um, you know, in that first game, if a couple of things, a couple of opportunities had been uh, grasped, there would have been it would have been New South Wales victory, and you know, the series would would have flipped the other way. That's the good thing about Origin nowadays is that it, it's on the flip of a coin. And one why there's very rarely a whitewash in Origin, and there's very rarely a whitewash, is because the team that goes two up quite often subconsciously drops that little bit of intensity because the series won. And because there's, there's not much between the two teams, invariably the third game gets is won by the team that's that's uh, lost the, the series already. So, I mean, that's, that's the pattern that's happened over the years. And you know, New South Wales, actually, they weren't far off the pace. No, they weren't. No. How did you as a coach make that happen? Was that your psycholo- psychology yeah, background? Yeah, it was. It was um, because it's I'm, all well and good. I'm sure every co- it means the same, but you know deep down it's not because the the ingredient of pressure mm. is not in the mix. Yeah. The mission to win the series, the, to win the shield, is done. Yeah. So it's well, so it is different. Well, the funny thing is that um, when in 2000, when when we actually had the series. Um, packed it in the bag we won the first two games right so what happened was we come to the third game and the guys during the week now they're quite relaxed because the series is won which is good what you want but you want them focused so we get to training and then they start practicing and we've got the training session then at the end of the training they're practicing this post try celebration which is the hand grenade right so you know there's a hang throw, throw the ball up and the hand grenade all dive on the ground and and um, that was going to be the post, post And I was, I couldn't, I've, I was, I thought they're getting distracted. They think they're just going to win this game. So anyhow, I got them in the room and um, and I sort of said to them, you know, that post-try celebration, I said, you can pack that away and if we win the game, if we're 40 points in front, you can do the, you can do the post-try celebration, right? That's the only, yeah, so, so just pack it away. I said, because you wouldn't believe it. We won by 56 to 16 and they do the post try celebration. <laughs> and that was perhaps the catalyst to <laughs> Queensland. It was oh. quite funny. And that's right. Yeah, and, then, and then Queensland, which understandably back then there was the post try celebrations was the big thing, right? Mm. Nowadays it's all in the news again because yeah. there's money going to charity and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, back then it was um, it was funny. But but the, but. It was really the, the the message was: Do you want to write? Do you want to become part of history? Because very few teams win a win a series in whitewash, you know. So we really got to be focused. And uh, it was quite funny going to the game. The guys were quite relaxed, and and they were joking around in the in the bus to a point. And I thought, I thought, geez, I'm a bit worried here. And uh, anyhow, what happens is they took that onto the field and they just threw the ball around, and the ball stuck. Had passed it stuck and. Ended up winning the game quite comfortably, so it was um, yeah, it was good. Yeah, that's a great story. That yeah, that it was pop pack away and unless you. Brian Girdler you scored a massive number of points. Well, I think a record number of points in that in that particular game. Fifty six points was the the highest ever I think Origin uh, score. So that was um, it was amazing. And as I said, Ryan Girdler had a massive contribution to that. Scored a, few, a couple of tries and kicked a heap of goals. Yeah. Um. So would there would there ever be a temptation to go back into the into the Origin arena? Oh, I'm sort of past it now. I think. Yeah, you think it's done. No, no, I don't. I mean, I enjoy, I enjoy um, the role on the commission. I really enjoy working with with the fellow commissioners and Peter Volandis. Um, but no, I'm not really tempted. I think, you know, I think that that um, that Origin deserves to have someone who's contemporary in in, in charge and somebody who's, who's who's current in the game. Yeah, you speak about. You work on the commission. Um, you're involved quite heavily in Project Apollo. Um, so I think it was the um, March 23rd of 2020. Mm. The season shuts down after two games. Can you talk us through what happens then? Yeah. it's Because um... were you part of the game closing down yeah, so, so what happened was the commission, uh, we had to make a decision. So when COVID hit 
uh, in in Australia in uh, late January of 2020, um, we secured the services of a, an epidemiologist from you, from New South Wales Uni to advise us on the progression of the of the virus um, because it, it, we we sort of felt it was going to be somewhat of a threat, and we started the preseason as normal um, and. We started the first co- round of the competition as normal and then what happened was um, we were, the government basically sort of said we can continue to play but we weren't allowed to have crowds. So we started round two of the competition as normal and then the day after the round two of the competition finished, uh, we were called to an emergency – the commission, commissioners were called to an emergency online hookup where the expert – epidemiologist who was advising us um, said that in her opinion we were going down the the, the um, path of Italy where you know where Italy were had a really high number of infections and Ruby Princess docked in Sydney as well the cruise ship um, so that I think was was a, a cause for alarm and anyhow we based on her recommendation we we shut the competition down which meant that the game was losing every week um, in the order of 15 to $20 million a week from broadcast revenue, um, sponsorships, etc. So there was a lot of money being lost every single week. So what happened was um, at the back end of that week, a few days later, so, so um, the management were asked to, to uh, get a plan together to – Get the, get the game up, back up and running. And then a few days later, Peter Volandis rang me and sort of asked me to take control of the project and, and um, get a team together because he said, you do all this teamwork stuff with companies, uh, we can put this together, we can put it in, into practice, getting getting a team together to, to get the game back up and running. So, um, and, and Peter was amazing in terms of the, of the support that he offered in in in, in – the the process of, of, of restarting the, the the competition anyhow we I sort of got a, a some core people together and then we built on that and got more people to, in the team and cut a long story short <clears throat> we managed to secure um, some really good experts in that space uh, of the decontamination and and uh, public health and we ended up getting the being the first sport, May 28, we're the first sport to, <coughs> excuse me, to get up and running. Um, and we end up, because of the discipline that the players showed and um, and the, the, all the staff around the game, we, we managed to get through the season um, without further disruption. So it was, a, it was an amazing team effort across the game. I've never seen so much, <coughs> excuse me, I've never seen... Um, uh, the, the, the camaraderie across the game um, ever like I have. And I've been involved in in at the, the, the sort of top level for 43 years. I've never seen teamwork like that demonstrated. Yeah, yeah it, was a, it was an amazing time for the game to come together. I can remember being on some of those phone calls that would go for hours and just yeah. the small, well, change invokes – anxiety feelings at the best of times but it was a new time and a, a, a challenge that I guess nobody could have forecast or had too much uh, preparation for but I thought rugby league handled themselves amazingly in the NRL in particular it was uh, it's something I think we can all look back and be proud of just how quickly uh, we managed to turn things around but was there ever a, a, a genuine fear that um it could be catastrophic, catastrophic for the game. No, we, the the attitude and the f- the 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 focus that we had as a as a um, a, a central um, leadership group, which is what we were, um, was really really focused on the positive. And and we had um, the advisors that we had were were very positive. Um, they weren't risk averse. Um, they had a tolerance for risk, but they managed that risk really well. So, now we were re- we were really positive right through. There were a huge number of hurdles that we had to overcome. We had to get permission f- 
for example, out of New Zealand, we had to get permission for planes to leave New Zealand um, because no flights in or out of the country. So we had to get permission for get a charter flight out of New Zealand. Um, we had to find facilities where we could get those New Zealanders into to to to, um, to, to, to be quarantined and to go into camp. We had, we had to then deal with the um, Australian government in terms of um, and state governments in terms of where we could locate the players, go across borders. Um, the games that players would have to go into Queensland, play up there and fly back on the same day. They weren't allowed to stay overnight up there. It was a lot of logistical issues that were huge. The Warriors relocated for the rest of the season, you know, and for six months away from their families, which was a huge um, impost and, and a huge sacrifice by them. And... You know, now they're showing with the stability of getting being back home in New Zealand that they're actually performing really well this year. But I think that the, the, the COVID hangover has gone and this year the Warriors have really stepped up under Andrew Webster. So, you know, it was a massive um, effort by by everybody involved in the game that, and it was really – it was great teamwork. Yeah. Yeah, we, we can all be very proud of that. W- yeah. Was there Was there anything that you reflect on that really just blew you away? during that time because it, it wasn't that long ago and I, like I say I can I can remember having nervous moments mm. like real ne- I can remember actually so we were allowed we the season had been closed down I'd just come off a call and myself and Tyson Frizzell were doing some training we we live close to, um, to one another at Guy Mere Oval and he was really excited about this session. He was like, come on, like, and I'd just come off of call and I I was dejected coming off the call. I was like, I I, um, I didn't have the heart to tell him that, I th- that in my opinion, I didn't think we were going to play again. Yeah. And it was, I can, re- I can remember looking at it and he's got this big grin and it's like, yeah. I was like, oh, I can't tell him. So the thing was, um, what, one of the reasons why we, we set that May 28 date um, before we got the experts online on, on board. We had to, as a core group, we basically looked at the, at the graph of the COVID infection rates and they were coming down, somewhat coming down. We had to extrapolate to see where we thought that was back at a reasonable space. We hadn't actually secured and I hadn't actually secured the, 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 the services of the um, the public health expert that was was going to be able to negotiate with the government, so uh, because we didn't didn't know who that was going to be, so we set the date of May twenty eight, basically uh, on a not a hunch, but but we set that as this challenging goal, and I said to, I said to the team, if everything goes our way, what's the earliest possible date you think we can make, if everything goes our way, and that was that date. Everything didn't go our way, but we made that anyway. And this is that goal setting piece that I talked about a bit earlier. And the finish line. Yeah, the absolutely. Importance yeah. of having a finish line. Yeah. But one of the reasons why that was important was because when we shut the game down, within two weeks of shutting the game down, there was a two hundred percent increase in in the calls to the mental health line. Okay. That, so we've got an internal mental health line for the NRL players and staff that can call if there's if they've got issues, and there was a two hundred percent increase in in the calls to that that health line, so that was a red flag that that we needed to get a date set. And one of the reasons for that is is you as a player, I've done all that off season training, you're prime fit, yeah. You play your first couple of games and you you're absolutely peak condition, and then you're locked you're locked up. You can't play, train, do all that sort of stuff, right? So, and one of the reasons why why you couldn't pl- train was because we, we couldn't allow t- – and new teams in New South Wales were, were allowed to train. You, you still could train from the government restrictions. You still could train. But it was um, – it w- we, we didn't want teams to get advantage here. For example, the Warriors weren't allowed to train over New Zealand, so they'd, have be, they'd be disadvantaged because they weren't allowed out of their houses over there to train. So um, the mental health – was a real challenge and that was one of the reasons why we really needed to, to get a focus, give the players a focus that we work towards and we had to be positive in our narrative around that so that the players would feel much more confident because we had enough naysayers, we had a whole lot of people in the media saying it's not going to be possible, they're kidding themselves, blah, blah, blah. But 
we knew the facts and we knew how focused we could be and we ended up getting there. We had something to aim for, yeah. which is important. Absolutely. I think Peter Volandi said had he been given another day or another week, he wouldn't have shut it down. Is that is that correct? So what happened was if we actually – we said – May twenty eight, or we would go for the next week, which I think was June. The oh, no, but I mean, not not shutting the game down on on twenty on March twenty three. He said he would have just kept running. Yeah, he had this time again. Is that? Yeah, the, 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 the in hindsight, given what we know now, we probably could have, but but we wouldn't have had, we wouldn't have had, um, we would have still had to, in my view. We still would have had to have gone through the process of getting the experts on board to give us the yeah. advice the way we went about it, because the way we went about it was was the culmination of the process that took a bit of time. So, so yeah, there's there's um, what Peter says is is right. We probably could have, but I think in hindsight. Um, we needed to go through the process we went through of putting all the mechanisms in place and the protocols and 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 the online apps that you feel completed every day. Not, not many people know that. When you got up in the morning, you had to complete an app. You yeah. had to take your temperature. You had, yes, to, we, you oh, had, to, you had to complete an app that, that basically said you didn't have any symptoms before you were allowed to leave home to go to training. Yeah. And then when you got to training, you got temperature tested before you went into the training. Yes, we did. There was, was, there like was yeah, yeah, yeah. a whole lot of there's a whole lot of stuff that really was restrictive uh, on players' like freedom. Temperature checking, yeah. Yeah, the temperature checking you know, quite often. Then, and then you had to go straight home. You weren't allowed to go to the beach and you know, all that mm. sort of stuff. So it was it was quite inhibitive of um, freedoms. But the players committed and we got to the outcome. Well, we we did. The, we did, I yeah. remember the, the Dragons had the, the barbecue. Were you, what happens there for, for you as a – a commissioner and one of the members of all the fat, well, the man in charge of Project Apollo. Yeah, and the reason we called it Project Apollo was because um, because the Americans, when when JFK and I can remember watching the Americans land on the moon in 1969 as a nine year old, I'm watching this little black and white television. I couldn't believe it. Mm. They're just landing on the moon, and um, I was taking the first step. Armstrong took the first step out onto the onto the the, um, the moon surface, lunar surface. And no one thought when Kennedy announced that back in 1961, no one ever thought it would happen. He said, we're going to put a man on the moon and return him safely to Earth by the end of the decade. No one – and even the people at NASA didn't think it was possible, right? And then what happened was um, when it hap when, when that, that – I'm watching on television, I couldn't believe it. So for me, Project Apollo meant you can do the impossible and that's why I wanted to call it Project mm -hmm. Apollo. And um, – and and we did what a lot of people didn't think we could do, mm. which was which was enormous. It it, it was, but when um, it nearly got jeopardised by the dragons, what 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 what's your reaction? Yeah, I mean, I, I was disappointed, um, and why? What really disappointed me was the because the players were all told and all knew that they'd taken a pay cut. Okay, they'd all taken a pay cut. Everybody, all the players, administrators, officials, commissioners, we all took a pay cut, 20% pay cut, right? Up front because the game's income was cut by a significant amount. And all everybody knew that if there was a breach and we had to shut the game down again, there'd be further pay cuts. So players, all the players knew that the, the risks were, were not worth taking because everybody, if I did something stupid and the game was shut down, there was an infection and the game was shut down, that everybody would pay the price. And you know what the bond is amongst players. You don't want to let your mates down. So for me, that psyche um, was something that was disappointing because I thought, you know, that's just, that's just not what players do for each other yeah. or take the risk that could jeopardise other players' yeah, income, it, for example. It, it, was, it was a genuine risk of being shut down, had infection, have gone... Yep. Through a team at that at that particular time, exactly. At that particular time, yeah, it was a real threat. I just want to ask you quickly um, before we get the um, to the questions we ask each and every guest, just about um, Mitchell and growing up and life as a dad, um, the the pressure that comes with having a a father figure like you. Um, did you give him 
what was your role as the as as the father? Was it football coach or was it just always dad mode? No, I really um, as a, when he was a little kid, um, it was it was really about him developing skills because one of the things that when I was a kid, I was really focused on the fitness side and the mental side and stuff like that. I, I didn't develop as, as, as fine tune the skills as well as I could have. Um, so for him, I, he had the natural athleticism anyway, and but he was just I was just conscious of him developing the skills, and consequently he actually moved into the halves and and is very skillful as a halfback. But as he when he moved into grade, I, I really it was really about more just the mental side of it. He his coaches. More, much more contemporary than me about the, the technical side of it. So they're the ones that, that really provided the insights there. I'd sit down with him. We'd, we'd have a debrief after games and have a chat about more about the focus and the mental side of it. That was more about where it was. And look, I hope you don't mind me asking you this, but everyone has their ups and downs. Some of Mitchell's has been played out in the in the media. How How's a... Like I'm talking on a personal level here. How's a, how the, how's the father take that? Um, I mean, a lot of the stuff Mitchell had got himself into in a strife over and, and made headlines was pretty much all the incidents were were linked to alcohol. Yeah, and um, for me that was something that I, that I was quite sensitive about and uh, really struggled with that. But um, Mitch has got got to a point now where he's playing overseas, a lot less pressure on him. He's um he's you know, off the alcohol, been off it for um I know you've got two is new as your sponsor, right? But uh, <laughs> <laughs> you gotta drink something, drink two is new yeah. so like <laughs> Um but uh the yeah he's he's really clear in his head and really focused and you know I, I think he's 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 learned, he's matured, he's learned um, and and he, he realizes what what his his um, triggers are, and it was but it was always hard, you know. So when you see someone criticized, and, and it was criticized probably way over and unfairly. Above. Uh, look, I'll say it for you. He was criticized unfairly. Yeah, and probably um, because he was my son, and and um, and you know I um, I had different perspectives on different things to to what Mitch did and but but having said that we have, we got we got a great relationship a great bond and he's 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 a great kid and and um you know he's enjoying playing over in in England they're leading the comp over yeah, there yeah they're they're flying at the moment win. yeah yeah could so be the first uh, first ever could first be their ever. first ever win yeah. for the Catalan Dragons mm-hmm. yeah yeah be yeah. be amazing um when when someone goes something like that when like I've I had it myself with issues have been played out in the public eye. Does he does he come to you? Does he does he say dad like Oh yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Like no, we um yeah, for sure. He's I mean he's he's a smart kid. So mm. but um smart people when they're under pressure and want to relieve that pressure, sometimes they they do some silly things and that's what um what he's done over the years. Um, there's never been any malice in what he's done, but Exa- not, not, he's, not that. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, but you know, we, we, we chatted through lots of stuff and, and um, yeah, I was, he's just, a, I'm just, he's a really good human being and, and that's what I really, I really admire about him. Yeah. Do you think, um, do you think he'll come back? Um, oh, he'll come back, but yeah, oh, I don't, no, I mean, he'll come back to live here. Yeah, but do you think he'll come back to to play? Um, I'm not so sure whether 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 he if they win the comp this year, I'm not so sure whether he's he, he, he whether he wants to go out on that note. He might want to go. He want to retire on that note. He's, physically, his body's great, but as you know, James, the pressure and and, and um, the the the, the um, emotional stress that's that comes from being. Not just a first grader, but when you're a playmaker oh. in first grade, so you only got to look at the halfbacks at Origin getting that, that, that get hammered each year, or, or the halfbacks at the clubs, because they're they're your quarterbacks, mm. they're the ones that are that, that cop the brunt if a team's not performing that well, and and um, 
for Mitch Hurtman, he's got to weigh up whether or not he, he wants to, to play on next year. And, um, and and I don't I think at the moment he's in, indecisive about what he does next year because I think he's just seeing how how he's just enjoying the moment more yeah, now. Just and that, yeah. and that, I think that's the the key as you get older. If you can just enjoy the moment rather than I've achieved this, what's my next goal? Then you can really enjoy yourself more. I, I think as well, like g- given his age, just what it takes to get out there, mm. like to get yourself in the building, to get yourself on the field. Yeah, you know, the playing is the easy part. That's what yeah. you love. It's right. It's, it's all that and, off-season preparation. Yeah, and, and just, you know, it, you have to be so selfish. You have to be obsessed with it. Mm. You have to do, you have to be so meticulous. Yeah. And it can be quite mundane at times, which, you know, you get to live the dream. Yeah. But. And as you get older, you know, is the priority around um, other things? Mm. Is it around travel? Is it around family? Is mm. it around, what is it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, well I guess it's a bit of a, a watch this space and, and see yeah. where he goes, but. I think if he's enjoying himself over there, just stay. Yeah, he, he's enjoying himself. He's in, it's, it's a great spot. I mean, if you're going to be playing in, in the English Super League, as you would know, uh, probably the best place to live is on the French Riviera, or the French Mediterranean. Well, you've obviously not been to St. Helens, have you? <laughs> yes, I have, actually. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm a Liverpool. It's a right uh, nasty <laughs> old bar, isn't it? <laughs> I'm a Liverpool lad, so, mate, if, if Mitchell Pearce is going to move, maybe sign for St. Helens, <laughs> go live in Liverpool. Take on the French Riviera yeah. any day of the week. <laughs> Mate, well, um, we have got those four questions. I just want to just quickly touch. You do um, your your teamwork stuff with, with the corporates. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that quickly? Yeah, yeah. So um, when I quit coaching, I, I sort of thought, well, I know there's gaps around teamwork and leadership, team leadership. In, um, in the corporate world because that's what I'd experienced when I was selling advertising many years before. So I sort of developed uh, a whole lot of tools and techniques for helping businesses become the best version of themselves, make more money, be more productive, create a better culture around around basically team teamwork. And um, and that's where I focus. I've uh, got clients around the country and also Singapore and Hong Kong, got clients over there. and. Um, it's great. I love what I what I do, and it's 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 sort of for me. It's an extension of what I learned in footy, but it's it's about the science of it as well. So there's tools and techniques, but it's also businesses. The gut feel around teamwork <coughs> isn't good enough in footy, and it's not good enough in business to actually become your best. You've got to have a science there, and the science really is centered around this psychological safety, trust, accountability. It's around clarifying expectations and around creating an energised culture. So that's pretty much um, where the sort of space that, that I operate in. And, um, yeah, it's a bit of fun. Mm. And those skills um, that you you learn about being a, a young footballer, they are transferable to the mm. to the business world and the corporate world. I, I don't think enough um, f- former rugby league athletes realise that, just how valuable... Um, they are outside of football. Yeah, I think that's 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 a good point that you make. Is that a lot of full time footy footy players now NRL players are full time. They don't realise that there's a huge amount of skills that they've acquired because they're immersed in this bubble of the NRL, and they don't realise the skills that they've acquired that can be transferable. So a lot of them get towards the end of their career and they start worrying because they've got enough money stacked up to retire, mm. which is the most of the players. Um, what what skills can I use to actually um, generate income to support a family and pay a mortgage going forward that the, the other that the world needs and there's plenty there's a lot of skills that they've developed um, around around um, the discipline component around um, the people skills component around the teamwork component there's a whole lot of stuff yeah, yeah. Uh, it, even something as simple as the the ability to to work on a weekend or an, or an evening for, yeah. for a lot of organisations that's like whoa, <laughs> that's right. What you have to train at night because yeah. you bought well yeah that's right yeah it yeah that's why I, I get some businesses coming to me oh um, you know I, I, we, we, because we're really busy during the week can we do a session with you on the weekend on Saturday of course why not yeah serious yeah because they realise that. Pretty much your whole career as a coach and a player, it's all yeah. weekend work or yeah. seven days a week work. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it's um, 
it's remo- it's just sometimes I've, I do some corporate presentations myself and you just, yeah, you, you, they ask you questions and you're like, yeah. it's almost so ingrained in the athlete where you're like, yeah, how can you not be like That's that? That's right, yeah. And then you have to, like you say, you put the science behind it yeah. and you realise how you got to now mm. with, with some scientific knowledge is so That's powerful. Right. Yeah, it is. So powerful because we become accustomed to it, right? Yeah. Where, you, of course, you're on time. Yeah. Of course, you carry out a game plan. There's one one high-profile coach I spoke to a few years ago and I said, mate, I said, how are you going to keep coaching for? You know what he said to me? What else can I do? And he was very successful. <laughs> I said, oh, there's a lot of other stuff. Mm. So it's not just the players, the coaches yeah. as well. Yeah, well, we we live in our bubbles, don't we? Yeah, we live yeah. in our bubbles, um, mate. The next part of the show is brought to us by Tui's. Tui's are all about teamwork. Great teams have great spines. Now, you play with a lot of fantastic players, but if you please, if you wouldn't mind, um, trying to pick us a one, six, seven, and nine. One, six, seven, and nine. And you know what? I in for me personally, I include the lock. In my spine, I think there's been a, an advancement, an evolution of the spine, which clearly includes a lock. And I'm just going to pick you. And the lock will shift and change now too to what it used to be. Yeah, and I'm going to put you in there as your lock, so you don't need no. to worry about that. <laughs> um, so the one I would, uh, I'd go with Gary Jack. So Gary Jack was um, uh, as tough as that, that as as they come. It was, um, it was, it was. He, he could break the line. He put himself on. He got under the high ball. Um, defensively, yeah, great. So I put him as the best best fullback. Um, halfback, I I put down Peter Sterling. Yeah, Sterling for me was was um, he was probably the the best player I played with or against. He wasn't too he wasn't a quick halfback, but he was, in terms of his legs, but he was very quick up here and and very smart uh, and consistent. Played that consistent high level every week. Um, number six, you know, it comes down to to um, Wally Lewis or Brett Kenny, and and both of them are brilliant players. But in terms of consistency, um, week in week out, you know, Wally dominated Origin, but I think Brett Kenny was was um, more consistent week in week out. And in fact, in '82 on the Kangaroo Tour, he actually um, displaced um, Wally Lewis as the, as the five eight. And um, and the hooker Benny Elias couldn't go past Benny. Benny he was tough as teak, smart. He really um, revolutionised the, the the hooking role way before his time. You know he was um, he he was the creative dummy half rather than someone who was just played at hooker because they could win win the ball in the scrum. Yeah. So Benny was um, yeah probably the, the best. And if I had to pick a thirteen, I'd, I'd pick Bradley Clyde. Yeah. Um, because he he um, he was just he was young young when I when I played against him I played at the back end of my career against him, um, but he was had a great work rate. Um, he was tough. He was um, yeah, he, he was just a good player, really good player. Well, I'll, like I said, mate, you don't get to choose the thirteen. I've picked it for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then yeah, mate, we got the three questions that we ask for each and every guest. Obviously that. Previous um, question is, is sponsored by Tui's great uh, friends of the show. Um, if football didn't exist, what do you think you'd be doing? If football didn't exist, we, sp- we did sort of answer that before. Were you starting to teaching trajectory or? Oh no! If, if footy didn't exist and I didn't get go down that path of wanting to play for the Tigers, um, I was going to be a telecom technician. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so what does that telecom entail? technician? So telecom was the old Telstra. So and and anyhow, um, when I was when I was about maybe twelve, thirteen, and and um, I was sort of starting to think about what I what, what I wanted to do before I was inspired around the. No, I was probably probably at twelve actually, and um, and back in those days, footy was a was a um, it was only part time, so you had to have another job anyway. So telecom technician was a job. A job, it was a trade, and it was um, it was a job, it was a um, government job. So you had stability there and stuff like that too. So um, that was that was what, what I would I suppose if I didn't 
I'm, I'm talking about as a young mm. kid if I didn't actually have this dream of the footy. Yeah. Yeah, fair play. Um, a sliding doors moment you think about um, had one thing have happened um, versus the other. So, um, for example. I sort of mentioned that a bit earlier about yeah. the alcohol. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, when I um, – when I could, I, I could have said, could have started drinking with the guys at the pub after, and then I think that that could have put me on another path, oh, which, undoubtedly, or which I wouldn't have. Um, don't know where that would have led to. So that mm. was probably the sliding doors moment for me. Yeah. yeah. Um, most most interesting person you've met, not necessarily the most famous, just well, the most interesting I think is 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 the guy I paddle with, Dave Skellen, the the, the Wi Fi guy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because. Um, He's amazing, and and yeah, you know, he's um, he's also got connections into the the quantum science field um, and the quantum computing field as well. So, um, and he's on some research boards, and like really quite fascinating. Just great yeah, to chat to him, yeah, because like, he's just his mind's in another in another place. And um, for me, you know, that's 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 that curiosity piece, which which for me has been a cornerstone of what. I think it's given me an edge over the years. Is just that curious, curious piece. Yeah, yeah, I can tell that that sort of slight edge looking at things. Yeah, think information. The <laughs> yeah, that I guess for for me the wife. I think it's like we we just take it for granted. Like we take so much mm. for granted, and we're not grateful enough. Well, we take uh, mobile phones. We yes, take, we take. Um, um, the ability to speak to people on the other side of the world to, yeah. to watch vision, like yeah. Watching um, that, you know, f- that f- when I when I said watching the Apollo land on the moon, Apollo um, aircraft, that was revolutionary at that time. Now that we're looking at other other um, universes, yeah, you know, so other other sorry, no, other other um, s- uh, solar systems. Or, sorry, I should all say. the ga- all the galaxies like yeah, far galaxies, beyond yeah, yeah, that we yeah. can possibly yeah, see. Yeah. yeah, it's 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 crazy, and even those like that's what we know. Yeah, that's right. Like some of those, like it opens. Do we up really a whole think there's no w- other no other systems out there with with some sort of living creatures? Oh. On them? <laughs> well, here's one thing for you. It's fascinating. It's like are we? The question is, are we alone? Yeah. It's fascinating if we are, and it's fascinating if we're not. That's right. Yeah. Like, geez, I'd love to know, but the just on, based off the odds of probability. Yeah, that's right. Got to say. That's right. <laughs> like, I think I was listening to someone talk the other day and they were, they, um, I think it was the Hubble telescope and they weren't sure whether these um, images in the distance were what they were and that they first assumed that they were just stars. Uh, but then next, they were, they were more galaxies. Uh, like other all, planetary systems, yeah. And, and, and then they're all expanding away from each other. Wow. Well. And it's... Oh, it's it, it's fascinating. I love that sort of stuff, yeah. like the looking out and thinking. Hmm. Mm, that's right. And as well, most of the stars that we see, a lot of them are now dead. <laughs> There's so many thousand light years away. Exactly. <laughs> so if they could see us now, yeah, they'd be looking at the dinosaurs and going, "What's the point?" Yeah. And then right. Maybe there's a planet somewhere that could see if they're spying on Earth. The light has taken that long to get to them. They're watching you play for them. Yeah, have you written for- some books? I like. I reckon you should be writing. Writing. Um, oh, you don't want to you, no. science fiction books? How good's that? Well, no, but it's true. Like no, pe- I know people, it is, but- people from other planets. Like yeah. if the sun was to if the sun was to explode now. Yeah. Like actually, like at this moment in time. Yeah. We wouldn't know about it for about eight minutes. Yeah. Wow. You can think about that on your way home because the light would take. <laughs> so, what would long. you do in the last eight minutes on this planet? Eh? Have a think um, about that. Well, I'm going to wrap this interview up. Get a <laughs> photograph with you. Probably run and get uh, go to the sandwich shop. <laughs> <laughs> get some lunch. Yeah, get some lunch. <laughs> Phone my missus and kids and tell them I love them and uh, see them in another life. <laughs> <laughs> Good on you. <laughs> what a great way to close. <laughs> yeah. ah, brilliant. Well, thank you so much for joining us here. I have really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much. Thanks, James. Again. I really enjoyed it too. And thanks everybody for tuning in. Cheers. <laughs>